A premium membership at chess.com will help you improve your game with full access to a powerful set of learning tools. Unlimited tactics let you practice like a master with more than 50,000 puzzles to challenge you at every level. Our library of interactive chess lessons created by master coaches will enhance every aspect of your game. And after each game you play, the computer analysis feature will give you feedback on every move you played, turning every game into a chance to learn. And that's not all. Premium benefits also include unlimited tournaments, video lessons, the opening explorer, and much, much more. Upgrade now to take your game to the next level. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the final week of Division A of the Summer Series. Um, I'm International Master David Proust, your normal host, and here today I am happy to be joined by Isaac Steinkamp. Hey, welcome, everyone. Isaac. Really excited to be here hosting another great week of the Pro Chess League Summer Series, and really excited to have Sam Shankland, our uh, 2018 U.S. Chess Champion, here playing for the San Francisco Mechanics, who will have uh, here playing tonight against Virginia Kobian. So. Why don't we just go ahead and jump right into kind of like our pregame, right? Cool. Go for it. You got any questions for Sam? So obviously there's been a lot of events that have happened since the end of the Pro Chess League season. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to since uh, the San Francisco, uh, San Francisco Mechanics last played their final regular season Pro Chess League match? Uh, yeah, when was that? I think that would have been back in when March. When was our right? last match? End of March, beginning of April. Yeah, I've not. I've not. I've not had the best run since then. I mean, really, then just only I had U.S. Championship, which was an extremely painful event for me. For anyone who followed it, I'm sure you'll understand why. But uh, since then, I mostly took a break. Uh, I wrote my second book, which should be out in October, and I, uh, I'm ready to go to St. Louis again on Monday for the uh, Summer Classic. Can you tell us a little bit about your book and what your goals were and when you were writing, writing your book? Uh, yeah, so my first book was called Small Steps to Giant Improvement, which you can currently get on my website. And uh, it was all about the premise that pawns don't move backwards and they seldom move sideways. It was all about, I broke down the five main reasons that you want your pawns to move backwards, but it can't, and how to avoid getting yourself into these problems in the first place. Then I also went over each reason again, but with the express intention of looking at provoking your opponent's pawns forward in ways that will harm their position. And so then for my second book, I wrote all about past pawns. So I broke down diff different kinds of past pawns connected passers, loan passers, and protected passers about their unique qualities in uh, the middle game and the end game. And since pass pawns are featured in just about every game of chess that so isn't decided by a direct attack or a tactical oversight, I think it's a very valuable one. Uh, as for who I wrote it for, I wrote it for me, just like the first one. I did it to investigate a topic that I felt I wanted to learn more about. And I think just based on the massive increase in my playing strength around the time I wrote my first book, it certainly worked for me. And uh, while it was selfish, my initial purposes in writing this book, it was just about my own training, uh, I think it would be a very healthy and very happy side effect for me if it turned into a successful book that helped a lot of people improve. Uh, so look for it to come out in October or somewhere around there. Of course, you mentioned that past pawns are like a big feature in every single game. And I'm sure segueing into today's match, you're aware that San Francisco not only needs to beat the St. Louis Archbishops in the live club match, but also do better in the knockout battles. What advice would you give your fans that are playing for the San Francisco Mechanics tonight? I uh, play for the love of the game. This is a fun league. Uh, it's not one of these crazy tournaments. It's online. It's uh, You can experiment a bit more. Uh, look for positions you enjoy and uh, be ready to make more dubious opening choices if you feel like it in uh, faster games because they get to positions you feel comfortable in. Uh, you'll probably see me at some point doing things that uh, I wouldn't probably do over the board. But, uh, you know, it's, it's fun and it's rapid and that's... You know, it, it's a more fun way of playing, I think, even while still being competitive and serious. Sam, until about a year ago, you didn't have much experience playing rapid chess. Um, when you when you play rapid chess in a serious tournament, do you take it as seriously as classical chess, like if you're playing against strong opponents? I mean, I, I certainly take the games as seriously uh, while I'm playing. I, I probably won't be as thrilled with myself if I pick up a big win or upset with myself if I suffer a big upset or a bad day. Uh, the stakes just don't feel as high, uh, even if even if the money is the same, which it usually isn't. But even if it is, like it's not affecting your rating for the candidates of the World Cup or things like that. But uh, I try to take it seriously. And for better players now, you know, who are 
up to truly elite in the world, which I'm not, I wouldn't call myself one of them, but I'm darn close. I'm hopeful I'll be there soon. Uh, Rapid is like basically half of their schedule. And so I have to, you know, up my skills in that because I've been focusing so much for the last several years on skills that will really help your classical thinking. That's all I needed to do. But now that A, I've gotten quite a bit stronger and B, there's much more rapid events at the top level. I need to prioritize that a bit more. Okay, cool. So this is, this is actually fitting in with some of the training you have to do to play in the PCL or to play in the summer series is giving you yeah, some more rapid practice. It's obviously not quite as serious, but yes. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we're going to go let you get prepared for two minutes um, before the match starts. Um, yeah. So it should be to do anything. I'll just get spoofed and the command will be made and I just start. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Sounds, just sounds don't get idiot. disconnected. That's your prep. Sounds idiot proof. And if I get disconnected, I'm going to write Verizon some hate now. <laughs> Fair enough. Sounds like a plan. All right. All right. So, um, so we are going to go over a few things about the format and the stakes and the situation here today, Isaac. But before we do, I always like to give everybody one last chance to run over and get registered and play and remind everybody watching that whenever they feel like it, be it this week or next week or in the last week of the entire summer series, they can get off of their chess TV channel and into live chess and actually just play in the summer series for any team they want. Yeah, for sure. We've actually gotten a lot more streamers these past few weeks actually participating and streaming their, their actual games in the live club, live club matches, even if they aren't rostered players. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this first matchup that we have between San Francisco and St. Louis? Okay, so our first matchup, San Francisco versus St. Louis. Um, St. Louis is tied for first place in the division right now in Division A. And they're obviously the defending or the current champions in the main series of the Pro Chess League. Um, so, you know, they're a very famous, strong team, usually led by Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So. Um, in the summer series, it's been Verujan Akobian, who's been, I mean, he's played for them all three weeks. So he's obviously their, their superstar and their hero so far. He's won two out of two knockouts, and he'll be playing against Sam Shanklin today. He's won seven out of eight games in the summer series. So we'll see if two games against a 2,700 player can damage his record or not. Yeah, absolutely. Verujan Akobian has been on fire these past two weeks, and I'm sure he'll be looking to continue his streak against the San Francisco Mechanics. It's worth noting as well that a win against the Mechanics would put the St. Louis Archbishops into the playoff as a guaranteed spot. San Francisco has to beat St. Louis tonight, so it's going to be a key game that we'll be focusing on throughout the duration of the night. Yeah, in the standings, St. Louis is four points ahead of the Mechanics. So um, if they win the series... The, or this live club match they're in even if they lose this they're still ahead of san francisco going into the knockouts and just need to finish within one place of san francisco to stay ahead of them um the other team in the running is chengdu which also has nine points like st louis so st louis could also get in just by scoring more points than chengdu today um so i mean chengdu and st louis came into this as you know two final four teams uh huge fan favorites like fairly large fan clubs compared to san francisco and san diego um and i think to me they were like the clear favorites going into this group and so far they have lived up to it for two weeks i don't know if you had different thoughts about which teams were most favored in this group i mean i think it could definitely be a toss-up because in this live club match uh you know format it emphasizes the fans as well as one specific player so in the first week daniel naraditsky did really well for the San Francisco Mechanics, getting five points in that first week and actually taking the group lead. So this could actually yeah. get a little bit interesting, especially if Sam Shanklin and the San Francisco Mechanics are able to put points up on the board against the Archbishops early. I think one team I want to be looking out for today is the San Diego Surfers. Finally scored their first point in the last round of that knockout battle last week. And Robert Schliachtenko is a pretty strong player. His VDA is a little bit low, but he's about 2,400 USCF. And he could post some threats for Zhang Di. It's the first time that San Diego has been a paper favorite against their opponent in any live club match so far this season. Yeah. So um, I guess the, the other thing that I could mention about this match is that this past week, San Francisco gained um, only one fan less than St. Louis. Um, and in the past couple of weeks, not only did St. Louis and Chengdu start out with the biggest fan clubs by, you know, 200 players, but they also were always first and second in terms of new fans gained in each week. And this week, San Francisco gained the second most fans and only one less than St. Louis. That one less than St. Louis might hurt them in that knockout phase. Um, 
where St. Louis will have those advantages in the knockout matches. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think uh, that might might be a small sign of hope for the San Francisco live club match that they have this new influx of fans this past week. Absolutely. And it looks like the games are actually getting started. So we should probably tune in to Sam Shanklin All versus Bruce right. Nicobian. These we are two should. players that have played a lot in the past, you know, a few U S championships. So I'm sure that there's definitely a rivalry here. What are you going to be looking out for in this matchup between the two strongest players in today's field? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm curious here as we're seeing them get going, what kind of, uh, what opening Sam's going to choose against the French defense, uh, VARs, French defense at many times in his career has been pretty fairly predictable. Um, Sam is among many strong grandmasters to currently hold a dim view of the entire French defense. So I'm curious to see what Sam can prove in the opening or if, because it's a lower state game, um, he has to save, you know, his favorite variation against the French and, you know, hold something back for, more important tournaments for him like sam is still more focused on over the board tournaments like the st louis classic that he's going to go i mean he'll be in st louis in, in two days as he said right so he'll be there Absolutely. with Barn everybody i mean the one thing i would say is that if white is saving prep i still actually like white's opening choice from a practical point of view i mean black's already gotten this iqp on d5 and you know in these rapid games you know the ability to get to a favorable end game even if it might be equal over the board is actually kind of advantageous in these pro chess league rapid formats so you know, we've got the white bishop here on d4. Obviously, uh, black playing this with bishop c5, egging white on to take the bishop with bishop takes c5. But I think white's going to hold his ground here, maybe play a move like c3 and uh, try to stock up, put a knight on d4, right? I think the knight on f1 might be going to e3, but I'm not used to this knight f1 move, so I could be making a mistake there. That That is new to me. I mean, Sam and Verusian were clearly pretty familiar with this opening. I mean, they're at move 13, and they each had nine and a half minutes, so they... They were both familiar with this position up to here. I'm sure knight f1 is a move that Sam knew about before he played it. So we'll we'll find out what it's about. And there we see your idea. E3. As you know, I know Sam pretty well um, uh, from here in, in, in the Bay Area. And uh, I mean, in fact, I met him at one of his very first, at maybe his first chess tournament ever. So I would guess that Sam would say, I can play a secondary choice against the French, not show any prep, and still get an advantage for white. I'm sure he would have something insulting to say about the French to explain, you know, what opening choice he has to make. It's really interesting that, uh, you know, at the Grandmaster level, people have such a dim view of the French, but I've noticed lately that a lot of these fans who are playing in the Summer Series actually hate playing against the French if they're playing 1e4 with white just because of the dynamic tension that happens in the center. Can you t tell the audience a little bit about these like IQP positions and why that gives White maybe a slight advantage going into like the uh, early middle game and you know potentially the end game? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean it depends a little bit on which pieces are left in the end game. In general, the advantage is only in the end game, not in the middle game. It's only an advantage in the middle game insofar as you have a position where you can safely trade pieces and get to the end game where you can actually show your advantage. Because in the middle game, there are enough pieces that the space that the IQP provides um, tends to compensate for the IQP plus potential rook activity on the two files next to it. So usually it's not like a problem in the middle game unless you've got a really bad position. Um, but the advantage for white is being able to you know, trade all the bishops off the board, go to an end game, and eventually attack this d5 pawn with a bunch of pieces. I think the ideal piece that white wants to still have on the board when you reach the end game is a rook yes. because you actually want to be attacking this pawn along the D file and have an undefended rook defending it from the other side of the D file. And then at some point you play C4 and win the pawn. Um, right. So I think it's quite important to have either two rooks lined up or two bishops on the same diagonal. So you can create a pin and like finish them off with uh with an advance like c4 and win the pawn otherwise you can tie them up to the pawn and try and create a second weakness somewhere else on the board on the king side or the queen side but that gets into much trickier uh you know super gm technique <laughs> absolutely and you know it's kind of interesting both players are just kind of stockpiling their their rooks in the center right now but black's pieces are definitely you know deeper into deeper into white's territory i'm kind of curious to see if like there's going to be a you know a static problem here with the pawn on d5 
you know, I'm looking at this knight on e3 and trying to figure out like where exactly is Sam planning on putting that knight? I mean, one thing that kind of sticks out to me is maybe at some point he was planning on playing c3, knight c2 and trying to clear that d4 square so he would have a protected knight uh, by another knight on the d4 square. But notice that black played this move queen d6. So if you play the move c3, you're going to be dropping this b2 pawn. So I think both right. players now we're getting to that phase of the game where we're going to start slowing down and try to figure out what are each other's plans. And, you know, I think it'll be really interesting to see what Sam does with this knight on e3. Yeah, I think C3 is kind of like a stereotypical move that you'll see a lot in IQPs, just saying like, you want to super control D4, so you don't need to worry about some surprise pawn break from black with D5, D4. But we saw Sam hold it back, even though it looked like, you know, maybe in a rapid game, you or I would just play C3 without worrying too much, like, hey, it's an okay move. But it's actually allowing Sam to defend the B pawn. So maybe he deliberately didn't play C3. Maybe he's playing with a slightly higher uh, degree of precision there. And um, I also think in terms of where the knight wants to go from E3, I think it's actually E3. I think he's actually pretty happy with that square because it's putting pressure on D5 and it's stopping knight to G4, which could be a way for black to do something active against right. F2. So, um, yeah, so I think E3 is kind of like a good square for it. And now that black's played H6, I think F5 would become an option if Sam needs to turn his focus towards G7 or some other target at some point. But the knight on E3 looks pretty good. Definitely. And, and you know, to bring up this idea of H6 followed by knight F5, I mean, there's various puzzle rush ideas already with like knight takes H6, bishop takes F6. You know, if this knight on E4 were to, you know, to move at any point, what do you make of Sam's move of, you know, G2, G3 here? Uh, yeah, someone was just asking in the chat, what's the point? And I don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure that one out. I'm not sure if like maybe this knight on F3 is maybe trying to reroute through like H4 or something, but uh, it's right. not It's not entirely clear to me actually like what this idea of G3 is. Um, you know, it makes more sense, I think, when yeah. the knight on F6 is maybe on G6 because then you're kind of blocking in this knight. Um, but I'll be curious to see what Sam's plan is here because it's not like he has a light squared bishop or anything. He's planning to, you know, you know put a bishop on G2 or something like that. Right. I think one thing to note is that both players are almost out of moves. They're almost in like an sort of like an equilibrium, sort of like a mutual Zugzwang. Not that they can't shuffle, but that they can't really improve, right? Like Sam could play King G1, King G2. He's not going to lose. And Var could play King F8, King G8 or whatever. Nothing losing about it. But they reach a point where um, they reach a point where they can't really improve a lot easily. Um, yeah, that's something I actually like to talk about a lot on my on my stream on my channel is the idea of between static and dynamic balance, which I think is something that Grandmaster Josef Dorfman almost exclusively wrote about in like a lot of his earlier works, where basically, you know, if you can continue improving and your opponent can improve, then you're just going to advance your pieces down the board and eventually win the game. And black is looking for more dynamic resources in this case. I think what white's trying to you know say here by playing like G3 and King G2 and consolidate is I have all the time in the world to just slowly improve all of my pieces. And it's up to black to figure out how do you kind of move your pieces around in the long term such that you don't lose this d5 pawn, but you also don't get passive. And I think that that's going to be the challenge that uh, Sam has today for Kobium. Yeah, so, I mean, the other way to get rid of back rank would have been to play h3 at some point, shuffle the king through h2. Um, choosing to go to g2 with g3. Still a little bit of a mystery, but overall the position is still very nice for white, I think, despite not knowing exactly how it's going to progress. Right, and now we see this idea of c3 because the queen's no longer on b6, so this knight on e3 can maybe jump over to c2, where it has this now option of going to b4, attacking the a6 pawn, or d4, you know, kind of occupying the central, you know, central square and making it difficult for black to expand here on both the center and the queen side. Yeah, I don't like this move b5 from VAR. I was thinking, you know, maybe if he played queen b5, um, Sam would still have to cover b2. Um, but b5, in some cases, could allow white to play a4 in some end games and create that second weakness that we were talking about a little bit. Um, you know, Sam's queen could even come to b4 and maybe knight to d4 in some cases. So I'm not sure I like b5 from, from Verusian here. Yeah, I mean, it surprised me to see B5 so early, and especially in a, like made in four seconds here. I mean, for me, like in a rapid game, like I, you know, that would be a move that I would want to, you know, wait on playing. And, you know, as Sam brought up earlier in his book, like pawns can't go backwards. So when That's you play right. this move B5, you can't go back to B6 or B7 and have a more solid queenside structure. He's almost committing here to basically his plan for the rest of the game on the queenside. 
Yeah, we'll see. I mean, that means that R maybe wants to play B4. I wonder if we'll see him also advance the move A5. I might be a little bit horrified if I see that move. We'll, we'll have to see. Sometimes it's instinctive. You're not sure how good or bad a move is, and then it gets played, and you just, ah. Oh. Definitely. So. And, like, one thing, like, what you mentioned earlier is, like, both sides trying to improve their position. It's still a little bit more obvious how maybe White kind of advances his position from here. But if I'm looking at the black pieces and maybe I'm a lower-rated player, it's hard for me to identify, like, where do my rooks want to go from here? Where do my knights want to go from here? How do I coordinate my pieces so I have a plan for black other than just moving these pawns in the queen side? So, you know, for our lower rated audiences here, how might a Kobian might try to, how, how might he try to like balance out the game, maybe equalize or try to get an advantage? It looks like he's going to do it by trying to break with a5, b4 on the queen side. He might also look for some chance to play knight d6 to c4. A common way to get something for black is to plop a knight on c4. In this position, I'm not sure that I see that working out. It looks like knight d6 might fail to knight takes d5. Yeah, I'm just double checking here to like make sure there's no like maybe knight f5 tactics after that. But that knight is pretty right. secure. Not to mention the idea that knight takes f6 check would that be a really good idea. Knight go to f6 with check. So and there's the rook takes e8 check option um, to distract the d8 rook off of the d file. So yeah, I mean, you'd have to double check a little bit, but basically after knight d6, you know, you would calculate knight d5, knight d5, um, rook e8 check, and then maybe knight e8. That could be the problem for white. Right. Um, knight d6, knight d5, knight d5. If what? Oh, maybe white could go queen d5 because the knight's right. covering e1, and then white is up the pawn. So he may not be able to do that at all. Right. In the meantime, I do like what, what Sam just played here with this move H4, just gaining a little bit more space in the king side and just kind of pointing it out to black that, you know, black still has to prove his equality here. I mean, just because it looks like it might be a simple position, like it's the burden still on black to do a lot of the work here. And I wonder with this move knight C5, if we're going to maybe start to see a little bit more action in this game with, you know, knight F5 ideas with the threat of like knight takes H6 in the future. Coming up, maybe white tries to do something with the e-file here now that the e-file is kind of cleared out. But I think black is maybe thinking knight on f6 to e4, right? Might be thinking knight on f6 to e4. Might be thinking knight a4. Might be thinking just knight b3, kick the queen, and then come back to c5. Uh, a lot of the times in these positions where there's almost nothing that the players can do to improve, right? You're happy to just make a little repetition if you're the person who's like marginally worse, which black must be slightly worse here um you know maybe you can't prove anything as white maybe you can't win the game but you know you show this position to any number of masters or ims or gms whatever master level you want and everyone will ask to have the white pieces if you just give them a straight up choice right definitely uh, and I like the simplification by white from the way, by the way. I mean, I think it makes it easier for white to play. And, you know, there's still no idea of d4 here. So this white knight can go to d4 followed by f5. This rook on e1 now controls the e file. So black has to ask, do I want to play rook e8 and go to this queen and knight end game? I think things can get a little bit tricky now. I mean, I think the simplifications are helping Sam. Yeah. And notice that Sam couldn't play knight g4 before black moved the knight off of e4. So the move that he played that created progress was a move allowed by Verusian. When Sam was playing G3, King G2, H4, it was like, it. I, I think it was showing that it was not an easy position to improve for white. But sometimes if you hang around, you know, little opportunities arise. And that's um, a lot of how chess gets played at this level is you get these positions where you can't quite break through. Um, and then <clears throat> I'm just seeing some scores updated. This is the one thing that I've been wanting to mention, I wanted to mention that the Archbishops have started out with a three and a half, one half lead, just sort of keep keep tabs on what the fans are up to. Um, but it looks like by the time I got to say it, the mechanics had already won a couple games back. And actually, this may be one of the closer starts to a fan club match we've had so far this season. Yeah, definitely. And it's worth noting that St. Louis got obliterated, frankly, in their uh, first live club match against the, the Pandas and only narrowly beat the San Diego Surfers in last week's match. So even though on paper, the St. Louis Archbishops might be a better team or might be a favorite over the San Francisco Mechanics, in these live club four matches, it's anyone's games. And that's why when ultimately it comes through to the fans and playing, like the fans ultimately determine this part of the outcome. So that's where I think all the teams are watching. I know a lot of teams are rooting for St. Louis to win because they 
you know, means that either San Diego still has an outside shot at getting third, Chengdu would automatically qualify. There's also some teams running for San Francisco to win because if they're in group B, C, and D, it's better for them maybe if San Francisco is the number two seed going into the playoff than the number three. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot on the line here, you know, even though these fans might be taking this as like a really kind of casual kind of game, right? Yeah. Okay, so another night comes off the board. I think it made sense that VAR played 96 because – I think he was in a position where it was going to be tough for him to allow knight d4 to f5, and then there's threats on the king side as well. And with Sam owning the e-file, I think he had to make another trade. So here we are. We're in this heavy piece endgame, um, and we'll see what the plan is here from Shanklin. But so far, he's got to be pretty, pretty happy with his position. Yeah, and I think now we're really starting to see the drawbacks of playing these queenside pawns so forward. I mean, I like this move h5 gaining space, but at some point, Sam might be looking for this idea of queen a7. As long as d4 can't work, queen a7 with then the a5 pawn, it threatens rook to e7. Now black's playing, playing passively. Um, and, you know, a lot of people might look at this position, position and say, wow, this is just an equal position. Why are we looking at this game? But a simple slip up here from black and the whole dynamic of the game just goes upside down. Yeah, and there's no way that it's equal either. I mean, right. it may be tense it may be not something that's like broken wide open but uh you can be sure that if you had this position as black and you offered a draw to any 2700 player they wouldn't just give you a draw <laughs> they would make you suffer a long time right they might they might not give you a draw but they might give you a laugh so yeah i, mean, I like this idea of rook to e5 here i mean i think as long as like white makes sure like all these entry points and like the king side and the queen side are covered uh, he's going to be more or less okay, and then he can just play for two results, which is basically for 2,700 GM. Like, that's the dream, right? Yeah, that is that is something that a lot of these risk-averse and strong players dream about, is having just two results possible, so they've got no risk. I think Sam's current plan is to try and arrange Rook to E7, so we'll probably see Queen E3 here. I think he was looking for a chance where he could play Queen E3 and Black couldn't play D4, Pawn takes D4, Queen takes D4. Maybe because of one of those rookie eight check tactics. Um, yeah, and this is where we talked a little bit earlier about like the static versus dynamic edge. We kind of saw that maybe black was running out of improving moves. And when you play this with queen c7, now this opens up the floodgates. White can move this queen and not have to worry about d4. So he's got a lot of options now. He can continue improving the position if he wants with moves like rookie three or f3 and then followed by g4 or something like that. You know, simply just kind of building up a small advantage and waiting for Black to continue making small mistakes. One little tactic that is worth mentioning, I think, for the fans is that Rook takes d5, just clipping the pawn right now, would blunder to queen c6, lining up the Rook with the king. And uh, that would just, you know, immediately lose the game for White. So Sam retreats the Rook to e3. I was expecting queen e3 in this position, so I'm not sure exactly why that wasn't played but it looks like Verusian's gotten one repetition in here with queen c7 queen d6 um there's also that three to one minute advantage for white uh which is another incentive to play on i think you will i think even if it were dead equal you would see a lot of top players try to use the three minute to one minute advantage to see if they might get a mistake out of the opponent Right, and I actually really like what Sam's doing. I mean, I think Akobian's starting to pick up on it now, but Sam's making really small moves that seemingly don't make a difference, but it's forcing Akobian to think if there's like a way to break out of his current bind. But as long as White makes these small improving moves, doesn't like, you know, accidentally repeat the position, uh, you know, it's going to put a lot more pressure on Akobian. And then he can start to think about going forward uh, when Akobian has even less time. And this is actually a really king. common idea, yeah. He took his king off G2, so there was something new for Akobian to think about, right? A little new thing to think about. So Akobian didn't play queen C7 because the D5 pawn was actually hanging now. So queen C6, and now Sam, you see him get into E7, which is a whole extra set of things for Verusian to think about. Now he's got to consider whether queen F6 is going to be playable or not before Sam plays a move like queen F4 and forces it anyway. Um, right, there's two entry my, points here for white. So queen my guess is that that's going to be pretty bad for black, right? If you get a queen trade there and then Sam goes behind the B pawn, oops, can't move it back. <laughs> and the D pawn might not be a problem anymore because black has control over the D4 square, but black's probably still going to lose that rook endgame at that point. So we'll see. King F8. Yeah. So what? King F8 is an interesting move here. I mean, black, uh, white could consider moves like Queen B4, which was, you know, actually what I was about to say. But there was also an idea of playing Rook A7 followed by Queen F4, Queen F5, keeping that eye on the H7 entry point. So now black yeah. can't keep this king on F8. And now 
now this is where the time squeeze of all of these small moves that were seemingly pointless really builds up. Kobe's got 17 seconds here. 17 and seconds. And not a lot of solutions. A lot of moves to play in this game. Right. And this is like, I think we see this a lot in the Pro Chess League, like these really strong grandmasters. They really struggle in these moments because they want to play the best move that's on the board. But, in, you know, in my experience in managing the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers, I've also seen like really strong players like make their worst mistakes in these moments as well. Yeah. Well, you see Sam smoothly going to exactly the end game we talked about. Um, this position is very worrisome for black, right? I mean, he's down a pawn. He's obviously got pawn weaknesses at H6, F6, and A4. So lots of things for white to work with. And with 10 seconds on the clock, honestly, I would say like it's basically hopeless, right? I would never be able to play an end game like this out with this amount of time on my clock. Right, yes. and it's worth noting that like yeah, all right. of these early moves, like h4, h5, they are now cutting off the black king. So even with all of these pieces off the board, these pawns are even more powerful because it's much easier for this white rook to kick off the black king and force it to stay in that corner, which means the white king can now come in and kind of take care of business. Yeah. Now, I think this move by Verusian f5 is super strong. I mean, you we're saying what a tough spot he's in, but he's a really strong GM who scored 7 out of 8, and uh, f5 was a really good-looking move there. Right, and um, rook f3, rook b3 here, right? right. And all of a sudden, yeah, this to play something like here. rook e3 and king f4 and sort of like inch over um, with his pieces here. Um, and, you know, we may question whether g4 was even a good move by Sam if he fails to win this game because of that f5 resource that seems so good. Right. I mean, white's definitely still got an edge here. I mean, I think with this f pawn, he's going to create shelter for his king. So he can still play a little bit you know, on the king side, I think this rook and this king are ultimately going to work together as a tandem, move closer to that queen side and kind of make it hard for this rook to stay, you know, as a powerful piece on the B file. Yeah, there's a good thing that you can do in rook and pawn endings, which is to cover both sides of the board with your rook. Um, when you can do that, it's, oops, there was a blunder. There. Rook takes a four. And now it's, yeah. you know, you just have to make sure that you're not making any blunders. And it's, it's an easy way the rest of the way there. Yeah. Well, now this is super comfortable. Right. right. And so for some of our maybe our audience members who don't really study rook and pawn end games because, you know, sometimes they can be kind of complex and frustrating, you know, yeah. they might be thinking like, okay, with this king on g7, how does white win if this pawn gets to a7 and the white rook's on a8 because you don't have rook g8 check? Well, there's two sides of the board, right? And white's going to slowly start moving these king side pawns up the board. At some point, distract the king with a check. And if the king ever has to move the f file, that's it. Yeah. Verusian's playing some great defense for a man with a few seconds on his clock. Absolutely. He's making it tough. I mean, he's down two, two pawns. That's not, that's not easy to stay in the game. I mean, we've definitely seen a Kobe in so far this summer series like survive really like awkward positions with very limited time. The one that comes off to the top of my head is uh, when he beat Alex Costello in the first week of the knockout battles from a worse position and in time trouble, just being able to complicate the position a little bit. Uh, he's very good at you know being able to deceive his opponents to making him think that the position's easy to play. Yeah, it looks like Sam may have been objectively winning and for all his heroic defenses sort of found the way to do it. Here Sam's threatening the famous trick rook check and then rook to the A file. Um, right, one thing that I think might be hard for, for Black to stop here. Six. Yeah, I mean, I think the white king can go to b6. I think ultimately if this white king can go to c8, for example, so like king b8, rook b3, check king c8, it becomes very hard for black to stop this pawn. And I think at that point, white just wins the game. Yeah. Sam's thinking some now. I think he's sort of slightly messed it up. What he... Oh, but that does it. Now he's got the rook check and the rook to the to the a file. Right, and that was really good discipline there. I mean, using that extra time that he has while Kobe has six seconds left. And now this yeah, is Yeah, he was double checking point. if his king could get to the H pawn in time there. And it could. Right. <laughs> and so the, the important part here is that the, the black pawn on H5, now on H4, is not further down the board and the king's not already on the H file because it's very, there's a few cases where this is actually a draw uh, if the, the king and the pawn are far, far enough down the board and the rooks in the G file. Well, that was very nice um, play by both of them, that rook ending at that speed quite instructive how that went and it's worth noting by the way that now the mechanics have a 13.5 to 10.5 lead in the live club match at about the halfway point wow so i did want to check in on that given given that their their next game will will just be starting um and it looks like verusian's taking a second to notice that the new game has popped up so hopefully he'll he'll notice that really soon but this is a good time for us to sort of pop over and look at the club match score and see that the mechanics are actually narrowly ahead um, 
what a tense match. And since we're talking about like the implications on the playoffs and like what would happen if uh, uh, San Francisco were to win the match, let's talk about how San Francisco gets into the Summer Series Championships. Obviously, you have to be the top two in the group. San Francisco, you know, unfortunately got zero points last week. Derek Wu scored a very important point for San Diego. Yeah. So how does San Francisco find its way into that, you know, that top two going into the Summer Series Championships this August? I mean, one part of it is kind of simple. They need to just sort of like win everything, right? They need to win this live match. Then they need to pretty much win the knockout also from Sam. Um, Sam Shanklin will be representing them in that four-player knockout bracket. So they pretty much need to win all that. And even that is actually not even going to be enough. So that's where it gets complicated. Basically, because there's so many points behind, they need st louis to finish at least two points below them in the knockout so they would not only need sam to win the knockout they would need verusian to finish in third or fourth place right or they would need chengdu to lose their match to the surfers right and have the chengdu player finish in third or fourth place one thing that I think that was interesting that you brought up, St. Louis had one more fan gained this week than San Francisco, and that changed the tie break, like the tie breaks and the pairings for the knockout battles. Had yeah. San Francisco had that one additional fan, they would have White all the way through, and Jacobian would have had to play Zhang Di, someone who he's lost to earlier in the summer series. In fact, the only game that he's lost, and that could have made things a little bit more interesting since Chengdu and St. Louis, if one of them finishes in last in the knockout battles, it could ultimately open this thing wide up, wide open. Yeah. Also, seeing such a close match, it could have given. If the match finished in a tie, it could have given San Francisco two points and St. Louis one, but instead it would be St. Louis would get two and San Francisco would get one. Now, I think San Fran is in such a tough spot. I think they have to win the match. So drawing the match, it wouldn't matter if they got that one point or not at at this point. Right. But um, yeah, anyway, it's a tough road for them. But uh, as any like professional player will tell you, like right now, all we can do is, you know, play our best games and try and win. You know, they, they can't worry about what's going to happen to Chengdu in their match against San Diego or how's Verusian going to do in the knockout. Sam just has to, I guess, rough Verusian up the best he can so that Verusian's in a bad mental space when he goes into the knockout. Not that Verusian seems to have any chinks in his psychology these days. From the interviews we had with him the last couple of weeks, he seemed pretty solid in his head. <laughs> right, and it's worth noting that, you know, San Diego beating, you know, Chengdu in the later live club match tonight would definitely help the San Francisco mechanics. But a situation that might be awkward is if San Francisco loses to St. Louis tonight and then doesn't do well in the knockout battles, San Diego beating Chengdu might actually see San Diego jumping into third place into the standings, which could ultimately knock the San Francisco mechanics out of the playoffs altogether. That's right. Yeah, I mean, they're not so far ahead of San Diego that San Fran can't finish in fourth place. That's the big possibility as well for them. Um, let's look for a second at this, uh, Queens Gambit exchange. This is, a, you know, super important structure in all of chess. So worth taking a look at it, seeing how it's going. Um, and black's playing a pretty common idea here and and black's playing a pretty common idea here in the Carlsbad pawn structure. I mean, we know about the minority attack with the A and B pawns going up on the board and trying to attack C6 and black played this really common idea of just playing for B5 conceding that the backwards pawn of c6 is weak but ultimately saying okay i have one weakness i can protect this how are you going to make progress and it's very difficult to do for white yeah the the thing is um black stops white from playing b5 creating that weakness gaining that space but it's very important for black to get this outpost on c4 once they've committed to this approach right right now in this position sam would want to play knight d6 except for oops bishop h7 or he would want to play knight to b6, except, oops, knight e5. And now c6 is hanging, so he can't play knight c4 as far as I can tell. I mean, maybe Sam's calculating something like that, where he sacks knight c6, he's got knight a3 at the end, but, you know, I don't know. Um, But uh, at the moment, it looks like he doesn't have a way to move either knight towards c4, and... If Verusian played a move like knight to e2, for example, uh, Sam doesn't want to be caught with c6 hanging, right? He wants to play knight c4 in response, and it doesn't seem that he has a way to do that. Okay, and so he plays rook a6. That's a slightly awkward move. I would say it's the kind of move you play not when things are exactly working out for you in this opening. It's not terrible. It's not terrible. Right. Um, the rook's still on the open file, so it didn't go like super passive. 
but it's not a piece of like the smoothest way to play this as black, right? You don't get that feeling like everything's working out for you. Um, you know, in some cases you won't be able to play knight b6 because it'll hang c6. So you'll have one less way to try and get a knight to um to c4. And right. uh and one thing I think are some of our audience members might be thinking about this move, rook a6, is like, hey, isn't this a great move for black? Because then this rook on e8 can eventually go to a8, and then black just plays in the a file. Well, if you look at the a file, there's actually not a lot of entry squares because the c3 knight covers both a4 and a2. And in moving your rook over to a8, you're actually losing control over the center, specifically that square on e4. So it's actually a very tense position, and black has to be very delicate about the way that he kind of improves, uh, improves his position and improves his structure. Yeah, if black really wanted to go for the a-file, they wouldn't play the move rook a6. They would play the move bishop b7. Sort of letting that bishop hunker down and defend the a the c-pawn and preparing to play knight takes knight at some point, followed by rook a2 or rook a4, one of those squares defended by the knight, and then the other rook coming to a8. So Sam playing rook a6 to me says that he still wants to keep his bishop on the diagonal towards the king side, and he's still hoping to engineer a way of moving this knight on d7. Um... But honestly, I, I I feel like things are pretty tough for Black here. A little, yeah, little bit tied up. Things are definitely a little bit tense here for Black. And it's worth noting that St. Louis has actually made a comeback. The match is now tied at 16 and a half apiece. Absolutely so, tied. With only a few games left in the standings, that actually makes some of these right. lower boards extremely important because there's wow, more games so going on down there. Huh? Gold Dust Tori is playing again. So she's got one of those remaining games that could be pretty important she won her first game today so good job tori um yeah no, is there any game there that you want to check out like maybe jay lee against art vega should we see how one of his other games looks let's take a look at how jay lee is doing he's actually joe bruin he's streaming currently on Ch on twitch.tv and he's actually streaming his games live playing for the st louis archbishop so it'll be really interesting to see how does he balance streaming and playing an over the board rap uh, or an online rapid game excuse me uh, that has like a lot of weight. So I'll be curious to see how he's handling this position. Well, Art Vega has the possibility of playing knight takes c6 here. It is his time taking, right? So yeah, so knight takes c6 is a possibility. White has sacrificed a pawn to create these weaknesses on the black king side. And I think white can pretty much win the pawn back by force here with knight takes c6, sort of. But you have to see both sides of the board, which a lot of people don't, right? <laughs> That's not right. a given for anybody um, to think that, well, it may just look like you sacked a piece for a check, but you have to be looking on the queen side for queen takes b4. And then, well, you just have a massive advantage for white, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even think you need this pawn on c6 to maintain the advantage. I already like white's position. And, you know, to <laughs> counter that idea of taking the pawn on c6, this square on c5 is also really weak too. So what maybe white is considering is how do I put that knight on a4 that's currently doing nothing onto yeah. the c5 square? If I can play knight c5, bishop takes c5, and then rook takes c5, Black yeah. having that pawn is actually a bigger impediment to black than for white because now white black is stuck with this light square bishop on d7. Well, I mean, he could always move it away and sack the pawn. I would say white's definitely better off winning back the pawn. Much, much, much better off than this move here because then white's not down a pawn. Black's still tied down to defending the d5 pawn just the same as the c6 pawn in a certain sense, right? And that position I showed, um, if, you, if you look at this for a second, you'll see that Black actually, the material's equal. Black has a bad bishop still, right? Mm -hmm. And black has five isolated pawns. So like every end game's lost, almost any middle game's lost because their king position's worse and the knight's better than the bishop. It's like almost a one result position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now that I'm now that I'm kind of like internalizing that position, I mean the five isolated pawns alone is kind of, you know, not exactly something that I think uh, you know, black is going to be super enthusiastic about. Yeah, it's uh, just unclear how anything ever works out once you're that wrecked in your structure. Couldn't put it better myself. And yeah, I mean, white's still got various attacking ideas as well. Not you know, not just on c6, but maybe at some point queen h5, knight f5 kind of ideas. This bishop on you know b4 could be a little bit vulnerable to maybe like a knight d3, knight f4 reroute as well, which would not only open up the c file, putting more pressure on that c6 pawn, but also shift gears to the king side, try to attack that black king. St. Louis has just gone up one point, but there's also been action in the in the in our prime game between Verusian and Sam. So Verusian went to the A file, and by playing H5, Sam allowed the knight on E4 to move to D6 because now H7 isn't winning material. Mm -hmm. He got the knight C4 maneuver, 
And uh, then Verusian just cracked the center open with D5. And it looks like with a rook on the seventh and a knight coming to D5, that white should be much, much, much better and more active. And yeah, definitely. Middle game here. I mean, this is one of those positions that I've you know kind of seen a lot of in like the pro chess league where you're better dynamically, your pieces are just better coordinated, but you also want to be careful. You want to make sure that you're not simplifying in the wrong way. I mean, keep in mind black does have a pawn on C4 here. So I suspect what we're gonna see is a Kobian's gonna kind of hit the tank a little bit, use this five minutes. There we go. He plays this move knight to C7, hitting this B5 pawn. But this is the kind right. of moment where a Kobian's gonna start slowing down and making sure that he can, you know, convert this resource and get that point back for the St. Louis Archbishops. Yeah, he may have been carefully calculating some lines with queen b6, knight takes e8, which could get weird. But yeah, I was very careful to say that Verusian's better in the middle game, right? I didn't necessarily better period because Absolutely. an end game could go quite badly even for, for white here. If Sam just moved the rook and allowed knight takes b5, then I guess there would still be queen b6. So it's still a question of whether all the tactics would work out. Right. I mean, the one thing that I think Sam's going to want to keep an eye on is how does he get this bishop on c8 into the game? With this knight on d7 and all these forcing moves from white, if white gets too many tempi and starts maybe winning a little bit of material, like this pawn on b5, for example, and starts moving his b4 pawn down the board, doesn't exactly leave black with a lot of time to kind of figure out where his pieces belong. So rook to f8 here, we're going to see if, what, if white's going to bite the bullet here with knight takes b5 and then queen d6. Yeah. And, I mean, it seems like it should work out. Knight b5, queen b6, white would have either knight f3 to d4 to defend the knight or rook to a5 to defend the knight. Um, it it feels like this should be winning for white, I want to yeah. say. I mean, I know it's tactical, so it shouldn't just be feel, but, you know, you're guided a little bit by your instinct, and then you also mix it with the uh, with the calculations. Right, and I think one thing that's going to make it very difficult for Sam to play this position with black is, you know, if he loses the b5 pawn, that c4 pawn is no longer a strength, it becomes a weakness. And so, you know, in yeah. the static sense of things, white's going to get this past b4 pawn, and it's going to move very quickly up the board. I think that uh, it's very safe to say here that Akobian's in the driver's seat. Oh, I guess I was being silly. I mean, the plan is probably on knight b5 to play queen takes b4, huh? That's better than queen b6. I mean, that's definitely that's definitely an idea here for white. But I mean, okay, white doesn't have to take this pawn on b5 immediately anyways. No. It's not like black can play this move bishop to a6. Uh, in fact, I mean, like white could play this move queen to c3 and allow this move queen d1 check. But after king to h2, the threat still stands. How are you going to save your queen side pawn structure without any of your development on the queen side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be a tough question to answer. <laughs> definitely a tough question to answer. And here he goes with knight for knight b5. b5. A little and bit surprising there. Course. Queen B4 was much better than Queen B6, which was Definitely. like, but this is this is still a little bit more of a mess, but the instinct still says that Black's a long way from getting out of this. But now at least he's got chances of maybe only losing one pawn on the queen side and drawing certain end games with four on three on the king side. Yeah, I wonder a little bit if maybe a Kobian's plan is to try to make Sam have to defend the C4 pawn after playing a move like Rook to C7 and then following through with maybe ideas like Knight to G5 playing for mate on the king side so he can play on both sides of the board. So that might be why uh, Sam just played this move Queen C5, stopping both Rook C7 and Knight yeah. G5. So now White has to regroup a little bit, maybe play a move like H4 to set up a little bit of a hook on the G5 square. Man, but Isaac, I, I, I've done the commentary every week. I haven't seen a match that felt this close or that swung back and forth so often. It was 17.5, 16.5 for St. Louis. Then it was tied. San Francisco went up 19.5 to 17.5. But now I see St. Louis just got a point back. They're only one point down. Um, and it looks like Goldust Tori, who is white here, is down two rooks. So that's definitely a point back for the archbishops. So essentially, we're playing with kind of like a tied match. And uh, we've got this tense game between Sam and Verusian. Absolutely. Which honestly, with the way GMs use their time, it might be the last game. It might be the deciding game in the end in this whole match. Definitely. I'm looking through the, the other games, too. This is definitely one of the more complex games that are still remaining uh, between yeah. you know, two similarly rated players. There's only about six games left in the match, so every point becomes very expensive. If Sam like, were, to, you know, were able to draw this game, given the match circumstance, I feel like that would be a win for the San Francisco mechanics. Here's one game that seems to be very much in favor of one player. This is only shallow who has white against good chess mind only shallow looks like he's up a bishop with a b pawn that's that's going for a touchdown so that looks like one game that's pretty clear if you look at the game between art vega and jay lee which we've looked at before you can see how much white would rather have gotten rid of that c6 pawn right i mean yes black's kind of tied up to it but 
or tied down to it. But look how much work he's putting in basically just to win that C6 pawn eventually. And he'll have to simplify his knight for the bishop to do it. Right. And that, um, that's the kind of concession where I think Black is a little bit relieved that there's no longer this bishop on the board that was kind of blocked in by all of these pawns. And Black is going to start getting a little bit more active. Definitely yeah. worse, but actually has like reasonable chances. Although you can't play bishop takes c6 here, I believe. Right. So it may tactically, it may work out that Black was so tied up that when White cracks through, it really, it really cracks him. So it looks like he can't take because he'll lose on the c file. He has to move this bishop or queen now. 94 or 97, right? So. I think you have to play like rookie four, right? Doesn't look like he has got a good defense. Rookie four, 97 check. Yeah, rookie it's just game seven, over Rookie seven and should win for white as well. Um, so he's thinking about that. Let's click back to salmon for rouge and queens have just been traded. Let's see how that happened. Queen a2, g6, queen c5. So Verusian trades off Sam's most active piece or only active piece, the queen. Um hoping that this will give him a chance to, to round up and capture the C-pawn before Sam's rook and bishop get in the game. Right. We were talking earlier about practical decisions and whatnot and allowing queen takes b4 and how this messed things up. But I think after trading the queens, we're going to start to see that white is going to dominate where these black pieces go, and that's going to make things difficult uh, mm -hmm. for black. Yeah. Sam is, Sam is kind of hunkered down here with rook b8. It seems very likely that he will lose the C-pawn as Verusian sort of counting on him to lose it, so to speak. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely yeah, the very bet here. What's the match score now? So it's 19.5 all. There's 19. this game current. <laughs> there's currently this game going on, as well as uh, Art Vega versus Jay Lee, which is still going on, but we figure Art Vega is going to score a point there for the San Francisco Mechanics. Maybe. Only Shallow playing against Good Chess Mind, and I believe. Those two games we've checked on. There's one other game between oh, Star C2004 and T. Gregson, uh, I believe, there's is still. There's also the very bottom board, Pokemon Blue Tree. You gotta compliment, you gotta compliment a 1,000 rated players using all their time. That is that is supreme. Absolutely, and it looks like they're about the same level drawing that first game, and this could actually yeah. wind up being the most important game in today's match. A it match between 1,000 rated players determining who's going to go through to the uh, the summer series championships. But we're gonna try and pay attention to Sam and Verusian for a little bit, see if we can pick up anything from how. There's like super, super strong players play here. Sam's using tactics to try and get out of this situation here with his knight on e5 hanging. He throws in c3. And it looks like his tactic is just to try and simplify a little bit and lose the pawn just like Vrujan wanted. Or is his plan to play knight takes c6, c2? I think that that might be the idea oh here for Black. Goodness. I think Okobi He's not now settling for bishop takes c6, knight c3, huh? Yeah, I think with uh, 20 seconds left, Akobian starting to realize this too. And I think the reason why he started spending so much time, if white just if black just loses his pawn on c3, it's still a very difficult end game. For, here he has c2 you know, and bishop e4 anyway, right? Doesn't Sam have c2 here anyway? Yeah, c2 followed by bishop e4. And I think, uh, well, bishop g2 also quite strong as well. And now after rook takes b1, there's a little, definitely, uh, strong you know, it's definitely black who's playing for the win now. Sam's, Sam's offered the draw. Uh, this is not something that you can win against another GM. So the fate of the match is in the hands of the, uh, the fans as Sam and Verusian draw that tense game. That was pretty, pretty good tactical defense from Sam. Absolutely. And there's only two games remaining. It's the very bottom board, which we discussed earlier, and Art Vega versus Jay Lee still going on, uh, where Black is basically down a rook to a queen. So I guess we should take a look at that bottom board and see if, uh, if it's getting close. Okay, it looks like only Shallow did win that game with pushing up the B pawn. That was pretty easy. So you want to go bottom board. Pokemons and blue trees. A queen trade is coming. And I and, think that, that was not what White wanted there. Well, White's the one who made the queen trade. I think with the black king out of play, White's hoping to pick up or trade off the B pawn with his king um, and try and scramble for a draw that way, which is not a terrible practical idea. Yeah, I think maybe g5 was maybe, you know, I say this <laughs> lightly, maybe a little bit inaccurate. Maybe you should have played bishop to e5 first, making sure that white king doesn't get in, and then bring in that black king, and there's no counterplay there for white. Yeah, but look, I mean, g5 advances past pawn and got his king a root into the game, so not bad. The pawn trade, however, I would say is bad. You don't want to trade pawns, but he's probably got white Sugzvang, and he's got the game, so can't well, really I mean, criticize anything. In, in these kind of you know, beginner le level games, if white can somehow engineer a trade, h takes g4 and keep the black pawn on h6, we know that that end game is a draw. Yeah. So 
This is the test. Yeah. Pawn takes this king take, and now this game's going to be over. So now it's going to be a that, win. That looks like St. Louis might control the match unless Jay Lee is able to engineer a miracle here um, with the black pieces. And it looks like that game just ended. So it looks like but San Francisco. Art Vega was the San Francisco player. I think the match may end in an actual tie. And that'll be the first the time that time. that's actually ever happened yeah, in the Pokemon Pokemon just won against Blue Tree. So let's tell the fans a little bit about what happens. And Artega once so it's actually a drawn match. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Right. So both teams will earn a point for the for the tie. And then just like mm-hmm. hockey, St. Louis will earn a bonus point for having more total fans gained since the start of the summer series. Wow. So St. Louis earns two points towards the standings. That points uh, that puts them at eleven points. San Francisco at six points. It's going to be a little bit tough now, I think. Uh, San Francisco is going, going to need to win the knockout battles, and then on top of that, hope that Chengdu loses and then pass Chengdu in total fans before the before August seventeenth. So, yeah. not the result that San Francisco wanted, but still yeah. mathematically in it to finish top two. I guess so. I guess mathematically in it, but uh, that was huge for St. Louis to to get that sort of comeback match tie because they were down several times. So, right, yeah. And if there's a silver lining in this at all for San Francisco. Uh, it basically means that in order for San Diego to qualify, the only possible route is that San Francisco finishes last in the knockout battle and San Diego wins the knockout battle. So even though this draw might see San Francisco move a little bit out of that top two, they are getting closer to cementing that third place spot, which is still playoff eligible. Yeah. And I mean, you know, St. Louis is a strong club, so I, I don't think you can be too disappointed when you go even with the chess capital of, uh, of the U.S. for the last several years. Um, so everybody, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick, uh, commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to have the four player knockout between the, uh, designated roster players of the archbishops, the mechanics, the pandas and the surfers. So stick around. We'll be back in a few minutes.
Julian, 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 Julian. And there it is. We clinched it. All thanks to our board for Julian Prolico. If you would like to try out, you can join our fan club and play right alongside Wesley So Fabiano during the summer series. But make sure to join our fan club, and who knows, maybe you'll be board four next year. And a, fun, and a fun introduction there uh, from the St. Louis Archbishops. That, of course, was their fan, fan video, which they were asked to record, you know, following their uh, Pro Chess League final victory. And, of course, with that win, that season now at the top of Group A with 11 points, two points ahead of the Chengdu Pandas. San Francisco need a, needing a little bit of help to get there into the playoffs. They're currently at six. San Diego has a lot of work to do. They're at the bottom of the standings with one point. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the knockout battles and how that will exactly work and what, what we expect to see tonight. So, um, first of all, it's a single game of 15 minutes plus two seconds. Uh, and if that game is a draw, then there's a one and one bullet game with uh, draw odds to the player whose team has the most fans game that week. Um, so, for example, Verugia Nicobian for St. Louis will always have the advantage, so to speak, in any match. He'll play white in all of his 15 minute plus two second games. And if those games are draws, he will always have draw odds in his bullet game. Right. And, you know, on the, on the flip side of that, San Diego surfers will have, will be up against the draw odds in every single one of their games or the tiebreaker, if, I guess, if you want to call them, uh, right. which is actually going to create an interesting storyline for them because for Robert Shlietenko, who will be debuting in any minute for the Pro Chess League Summer Series, this is basically an elimination game for him right off the bat. He has to beat a Kobian to keep San Diego in that playoff conversation a loss or a draw heading into the tiebreaker and then losing that tiebreaker, we'll see the San Diego Surfers stay home for the Summer Series Championships. I don't think that he's going to be worried about that. I think, <clears throat> you know, San Diego has mostly put itself in elimination from the, from the previous two weeks, and he just just going to play his game. <laughs> Regardless, they definitely have the opportunity to play spoiler. But, of course, what we'll be watching as well is the dy dynamic between St. Louis and Zhang Di representing the Chengdu Pandas. Zhang Di, of course, having a great week in week one. He yeah. actually drew Daniel Nernitsky in the knockout battle, and then he yep. beat a Kobe in their live club match. You know, if Zhang Di beats Sam Shanklin somehow, that automatically guarantees that the Chengdu Pandas are going to be second going into the, uh, going into the playoffs, which obviously would be a big burden to them. But should Zhang Di lose both, you know, his match to San Francisco and then in the third place match, that will likely see St. Louis take that you know, number one spot going into the Summer Series playoffs. So... Very important to get that right seating, and it all starts right here by getting the points that you need in the knockout battles. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, uh, I guess one other thing to mention, everybody, is that I, uh, you can play in that in that match that's coming up after the knockouts. You can play for either San Diego or you can play for the Chengdu Pandas in about 55 minutes or so after, or an hour after these uh, knockouts are, are finished. Yeah, it should be an hour, so. Right, and these knockout battles will start in about five minutes as well. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Chengdu, I mean, they've had, you know, quite a, quite a ride since the end of the, you know, PCL finals losing to Baden Baden and then getting their revenge against the Armenian Eagles. You know, being able to do well in the summer series, on, you know, on basically their fourth board player, that's going to be a, you know, that's going to be a big story should, you know, Zhang Di actually hold his ground here in today's knockout battles. Yeah, and from what I've seen, he hasn't played any FIDE rated events yet, so he could be their fourth board again next year. <laughs> With all this experience he's getting, uh, you know, fantastic for him, you know, holding his own against GMs, like you said, Naroditsky last week and a game against VAR in the first week, so. Right, not to mention he also drew Shakri Armamajarov in the regular season when they played the San Jose Hackers as well, so very strong, very talented 1900 rated player, I believe he's only 11 years old, which, you know, yep. ideally means bigger and, you know, better things to come in the future. So 
What are your predictions for uh, you know this round of the knockout battle? We're going to see two, I guess you could consider them lopsided battles by rating, but potentially yeah. tricky games for our two GMs here. Yeah, I mean, as you say, I mean, both of both of the underdogs are young, improving players who've had upsets before. So it's mathematically wrong to write off the chances for an upset when they've had chances when they've had upsets before, you know. Um clearly it can happen. Despite that, I mean, VAR has scored seven out of eight. So you know, you might assume that he's got something like a seven out of eight chance, you know, um, playing these games. I mean, he's definitely got to be a heavy favorite. And then Sam, you know, is not an expert at rapid play, but he's over 2,700 and pretty good at pretty much every part of chess. So, I mean, he has to be a huge favorite against against any 11-year-old in the world, I would think, <laughs> you know, John D or other. Absolutely. And with these lower rated players who are, you know, ambitious and maybe you could argue have nothing to lose in today's format, that could make them potentially dangerous. As the higher rated player, like what are your recommendations to both Akobian and Sam here, you know, to make sure that they get to that knockout battle final where they'll ultimately be battling for first place? I think what they're going to want to do is like on top of their rating advantage, they've got white in these 15 and two games. So I think what they want to do is create those kind of two result positions that you mentioned earlier, right? Create a situation where Basically, they're not going to lose, um, but where it's sort of uncomfortable for the opponent. So I think, um, I mean, of all the advantages they have, one of them could be, you know, more opening theory, knowing some like some ways to keep the pressure on with white. So I think they want to steer the game to something that's just going to be uncomfortable for the opponent all game long. And um, yeah, just keep them under pressure there. I'm glad that you brought that up. I, I'm sure you remember last week, you know, when Akobian beat Ezra Chambers in their knockout game, playing the exchange Slav, which of course is a drawish reputation, but Ray Robson was quick to point out last week that Akobian was basically walking into Wesley So's prep for when he beat Magnus. And as soon as, you know, he got out of book, he knew the, he knew the middle game positions better and it was just a matter of taking over the C file, dominating the game. So it's going to be really important, I think, for both Akobian and Sam to kind of dictate the tempo early in terms of getting the position that they want and then squeezing their opponents for the remainder of the game. Yeah. Yeah, so we're ready for the games to begin here. And I think that that's exactly the kind of opening that, you know, Verusian and Sam should maybe choose again is an opening that really doesn't give a lot of chances to the other player. You know, Ezra was never active in that game you alluded to, right? I mean, never had like a threat the entire game pretty much. Um, so Absolutely. we'll see. We'll see if, if VAR goes for something like that again. I've got both games popping up in quick succession. And... Uh, Looks like a King's Indian in Shliaktenko's debut. Oh, not quite your standard King's Indian, huh? Quick E5. Quick E5. Interesting. And that's interesting because this kind of looks more like a modern setup, although the pawn's on E3 and not E4. Because usually in the King's Indian, the Black Knight is on the F6 square by now. But I think one thing that maybe Shliatenko is thinking about is how do I get this move in F5 so I don't have to waste a move with this knight later? And that's exactly what we see here with this move F5. Yeah, the whole Leningrad Dutch approach to chess. Like, I want to play the, the best, most fun versions of the King's Indian attack, but I don't even want to play knight F6 to E8 to F6 and stuff. You know, I just, just got to keep that F pawn open. I imagine that, that Var would be tempted to trade queens with D takes E5, but he seems to... He seems to have had some knowledge of this because e5, which is sort of rare, he responded very quickly with e3. Didn't really consider d takes e5 too heavily there. So. Yeah, and I wonder if this maybe is a little bit of preparation from Shliotenko and trying to get the game that he wants as black. Because if black wanted to play the Leningrad Dutch, he could have also played 1f5, but perhaps then you could argue that maybe a Kobian doesn't want to play this move e3 and have like a passive bishop on c1, and maybe wanted something a little bit more active. So a very interesting kind of game decision here by Shliotenko as black that keeps the game dynamic and keeps the game favorable for him to have that chance to win his black or at least go to that bullet tiebreaker. Yeah, there's still some questions in the chat about who's playing what. So St. Louis Archbishops, that's Verugia Nikobian. Grandmaster Verugia Nikobian has white this game and uh, Shliak Tanko has black against him. <clears throat> I would have thought that the option of playing like already a move five, D takes E5, D takes E5 and trading queens would be exactly what Bar would want to do against uh Shliak Tanko against a kid who's um obviously playing like a dynamic opening you just trade off his queen you know kill that dynamism give Var an end game <clears throat> so I'm very 
interested what you know what the thought would be if I ever talked to Var again. I'll ask him, you know, why he didn't why he didn't want to go for that trade right out right away. I mean, as someone who plays the King's Indian, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't personally mind like this queen trade, queen takes d8. I think one thing that maybe Shlietenko is thinking about is maybe playing c6 later and basically saying, I have e5 and c6 in the position. You've got the pawn on c4, which means you don't want to play this move e4, basically giving black like a dream pawn structure, but you don't really want to play e3 either. Uh, and I think just wanting to have a little bit more flexibility, that's why we saw VAR decide, you know what, I want to keep the tension. I'm going to let black get the position he wants, but maybe I'm better versed in this, you know, in this territory. Yeah. So quick b4, b5, the tactical point everybody was that knight takes b4 would allow queen a4 check hitting the knight. The only way to save the knight and the king is knight back to c6 and then d5 would pick up the knight. So var gets a quick expansion on the queen side, follows it up with a4 and bishop a3. And uh, he's ready to put some, some pressure towards the d6 point or towards the center with that bishop placement. Yeah, definitely a little bit of a gamble, I think, with black with this knight h6, knight f7 idea. I know in the King's India and David Bronstein's famous for saying the knight belongs in f7 and not on f6. And one of the reasons why is you can play for g5 and g4. But that's usually when the center is locked, when white has pawns on e4 and d5, and black basically has full reign on the king side. Here, the position actually hasn't closed yet. So black's now spent one, two moves playing knight h6, knight f7, meaning that white can gain all the space in the queen side and really start to attack the center. I kind of have to say I like white here. Okay. I mean, he literally couldn't put his knight on f6 the way this game was going. Because if he ever did play his knight to f6, he would he would probably lose the pawn on e5 um, in some of these variations we've seen. So, um, you know, if his knight were on f6 here, d takes e5 instead of bishop a3 would already win. Um, wow. Props to Shlyak Tanko for, uh, for fighting here. Well, he has to, right? I mean, when you have less space, you have to play a little bit dynamically and... Uh you know, fight that static dynamic balance a little bit. So F4 is definitely a good practical decision. And he's staying reasonably close in the clock too. And I think that'll come back to serve him well. Yeah. Is he going to play E takes D4 here to keep things on imbalance? If he takes on F4, things could get a little bit static. Um, but if he takes on D4, he's sacking a pawn because he didn't take back on F4. But he's softening up the diagonal for his bishop and creating a real imbalance in the game. So maybe that's the way he wants to take things. Um, okay, he plays E takes F4, keeping material equality. Yeah, and now you have to wonder about this placement of this knight on F7 because for the moment, like while the, the, you know, the material is balanced, does black really want to play this move G5 to support this F4 pawn? I don't yeah. think that's that simple. Um, you know, with the position opening up in front of his king like that, this dark squared bishop on A3 can always come back to B2 and really start to wreak havoc on, you know, on black's king side. So he's yeah. got a tough decision to make here. The center being open makes it not ideal, but does black want to play G5? I would have to say yes, yes, yes. It's like, what else are you going to do, right? Because like, you're not going to have the advantage if you just slow play the game on the E file. Your pawn in F4 is just going to be badly placed, right? Absolutely, yeah. You already have some weakness on the C4, G8 diagonal. So I feel like if you've, if you've set F4, you've got to say G5 and G4 and then just put your pawn on F3 and hope that you get something. There goes the F-bond, see? There, that's some commitment, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is starting to look kind of rough here, I think, for you know, for Black, because Black, in all of this time, hasn't actually developed all of his pieces yet. This bishop on C8, the rook on A8 is still kind of you know, out of the game still, but White can easily bring his rooks into the center of the board and just kind of dominate with his space. Well, I imagine I, here he was counting on playing G5, G4, but VAR looked at the position for like you know, 20 seconds and said, nope, it's not going to work. But he must have had in mind some idea like g5 hitting the queen. If she goes to d2, g4 hitting the knight, and then it moves, and he wins back his pawn on d4. Something like that must have been in mind. For I mean, Robert. I feel like you kind of now are in that territory where you have to really look at these ideas for the same reasons that you wanted to play g5 before, right? Because if black tries to play bishop d7 and you know, maybe a6 or something like that to slow play the position, white wins that game 10 times out of 10. So Yeah, you're down on one and, and your king's a little bit weakened, so... But if g5, g4 somehow just like loses immediately, obviously Varushin played queen f4, so he saw it. Then, I, I, you know, if g5 lost a piece, I would say you can't go for it. You just have to say, oops. Uh, we'll see what else could happen. g5, queen e4 to keep the pawn on d4 covered. I was thinking about this too. g4 hitting the knight anyway. And then on queen takes g4, knight takes d4. Mm -hmm. Discovering the bishop on c8. That creates some mess, right? Because... 
we're opening up the bishop against the rook on a1 on knight on c3. So I don't know. If if Verushin calculated all of that and saw a hole in it, he certainly did it quickly. And Robert doesn't even go for it. Huh. Yeah, rook to e8 here feels a little bit slow. And now queen d2, and you don't even have this you know, ability to generate initiative with this idea of g5, g4. I definitely thought that that you know, was starting to you know, maybe look like there was some play there for black. Doesn't but... look like he has the ability to do anything here. I don't know. Absolutely. And one of the things that, you know, you know, I've referred to again and again is this idea of the static dynamic balance. Here, white is statically better, more space, better development, pieces are coordinated. And when you are worse statically, you have to equalize the game by playing dynamically, meaning pawn structure changes, you know, looking for tactics, various mating ideas. Here, black no longer has a single pawn break. The idea of G5, G4 no longer comes with tempo, so that's going to now be considered slow. And black doesn't have a way of fighting in the center that doesn't open up the position in a way that already favors white. Yeah. It's it's grim, but I think it's a pretty sound summary <laughs> of the situation. Dorf, Dorfman know. would be proud. So, I mean, it's like still the only move I'm looking at here is G5, and then you know White can play H3, for example. And w what next? H5. It's getting really sketchy. Yeah, and I have yeah. to wonder. Check yeah. out the other game too, right? Absolutely. Um. So this one here, Sam Shanklin as White, looking like he's played a bishop takes C6. Uh, I don't know what close like a bishop b5 Sicilian or something. Um, so this actually stems from a, a Larson's opening with b3, and okay. I've seen like a bunch of games like this played by Harry Bird back in the 19 teens, where basically you go for this idea of 95 followed by f4, and he kind of popularized this by calling it the bird bind, um, which is kind of a chess term that a lot of higher rated players refer to now. But yeah. you know, considering Zhang Di is the much lower rated player, I don't think he can complain of his position with black at all. Well, it's also, I mean, the opening that's more common than the bird that a lot of our viewers may have seen is the Nimzo, right? And this is kind of like White's created the Nimzo um, with an extra tempo for White. And uh, do you not think that the bird bind is a real bind? I mean, here it is with F4 played by White, the doubled pawn on C6 for Black, pretty good control over this B2E5 diagonal. I mean, if you think Jang D wouldn't be unhappy with his position, does that mean you think the bird bind's not much of a bind? Well, I mean, Black responded correctly, right? He, he decided to clear the F6 square by playing this idea of F6, and you know Sam decided to take on D7, but that kind of slowed down his development because at that point, Black was able to generate a lot of space in the center and play this, you know, this idea of D4. Uh, when I refer to the bird bind, that's not necessarily like a theoretical statement. It's just this idea of playing the knight on E5 followed by a move like F4 and then playing on the long diagonal. You see it a lot in the English opening as well in reverse. So the pawns on C4, sure. you play for knight D5, and then you play G3, bishop G2. Yeah, but I think that the reason this was originally called a bind is because the people who came up with this scheme for white thought that they had the advantage when they could set this up. And I actually, in early, early days, was a bird player. And oh, wow. I considered this to be like, this was like, this was the thing you wanted, was like this position. It was like, this was as good as as life could get, basically. So um, having now seen this a little bit more from like the bishop d5 sicilian or the nimzo um some slightly more reputable openings i still feel like this is kind of uh a pleasant position to play i think for sure and for shout out by the way to all of you watching the pro chess league summer series here on here on both chess.com and on twitch the 2400 of you guys thanks for watching today's coverage if you're watching from the chess.com homepage, make sure to tune in by clicking the twitch icon and watching the event on twitch where you can interact with our live audience and ask us questions you know ask us to cover specific games as well so make sure to hit that follow button subscribe to the chess channel and uh continue watching the pro chess league summer series yeah and uh, as i said before the broadcast even started we're watching the chat here you guys have any questions about you know who is robert you know where is he from uh you know anything like that, how to play the next match, who's coming up next week, whether we would put the white queen on G3 or H3 in this position, just ask. We're, we're watching you. We got one believer in the bird here in Twitch chat, so thumbs up <laughs> as, a, as a recovered bird player. One of my first ever students, actually, he played the birds opening until he broke about 1,800 or so. So it's definitely like pretty competitive to play, like especially at the under 2,000 levels as well. I've seen it do really well. Or nasty bishop d7. The the thing I thinking that black might want to do is play a5 a4, right? To try and get rid of that. 
Yeah, I think that that was kind of like my gut reaction here. I think the one thing that is going for black is that this bishop on b2 is kind of staring at this d4 pawn and the yeah. c5 pawn angers it really well. So it actually, you know, it's going to slow down white. And that's one thing that I can definitely, you know, say for, you know, for Zhang Di is he's done a good job of keeping this game close enough that as long as he manages time effectively and like, you know, find these positional resources like a5, a4, he gives himself a chance. Yeah. So one unfortunate thing is out of the bird, this knight's normally on d2, but out of the bishop b5 Sicilian and the um, Nimzo Indian, you often have this knight on c3. And then when the opponent plays d4, you put the knight on a4. If this d2 knight were on a4, I think it's almost strategically winning for white because black doesn't have a5, a4 to get rid of that pawn. And you've got this knight attacking c5. So then you can play bishop a3 as well. They can't bother your bishop. Um, they can't bother your bishop with queen a5 because the knight just sits on a4 and it can't, nothing can hit that knight. So you tie black up to the c5 pawn and it's over. There's nothing they can do. At some point you play queen h5 and win the pawn or something. I mean, it's just completely, absolutely, completely crushing. As it is, um, Sam definitely has some work to do with both his minor pieces, right? Neither of them is really uh, doing anything as useful as winning a pawn on c5 yet. <laughs> yeah, and I'm trying to figure out like how is Sam planning on putting his pieces together. And with this move king to h1, I think he's kind of telegraphing what his intentions are. Maybe at some point he wants to play this move g4, followed by rook g1, and then knight f1, and then bring that knight back into the game through g3, where he can still go to h5. Maybe he can go for this idea of f5. At that point, bishop to c1 becomes a likely out likely outcome, and your rook on f2 actually covers your a2 pawn. So it's actually very hard for Zhang Yi to find weaknesses if white is able to achieve all of these things. So black can't really just afford to sit around right now. He needs to find something concrete to, you know mess up the nature of the position yeah i think putting his bishop on e8 made some sense it can get involved and stuff on on the king side but maybe black does need to make some kind of some kind of break or some kind of change i mean i would think a5 a4 it gives him something to attack on the queen side yeah absolutely and you know i, I mean every move he doesn't play it i wonder why not and it's the gut reaction, right? And the nice thing about having this pawn on c5 is when you play a5 and white plays a3 to try to blunt this idea, if you play a4, white can't play this move b4 because of the pawn on c5 and the bishop on d6. So all of the natural kind of positional resources that you might have to combat this idea of a5, a4, they don't exist in this position. Yeah. Definitely a lot of time, though, being taken from black. That's one thing that like I'm starting to worry about as well, not being able to find a4, not being able to use that time to find moves like a4. Um, you know, Zhang is going to have to start, you know, being more assertive, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's going to have to do something, right? He's getting so low on time and hasn't yet done anything. Sam can just play queen f3, queen e2, rook g1, and like let him run out of time, then do something. Right, and we saw him do it in that first game too against Var, and so he's very clearly able to do it against anybody at this point, so... You know, I think it'll be I think it'll be tough for Zhang Di if he you know if he's trying to stay into this game and at least get to that bullet tiebreaker where he maybe has a shot of winning you know a bullet game against Sam Shakeland. And we and sorry, I said that comment as if Queenie Two had no point and Sam was just moving around in circles, but Queenie Two was probably threatening E5, which gives him E4 for his knight, and then immediately C5 starts to fall apart, get very shaky. So I mean, right. it wasn't without a point. Uh, and in response to e5, Sam immediately plays f5, you know, just creating a position where the the white the bishops are not going to be as good as his knight if he's given some time. Giant D plays immediately g5, h4. Now there may be options for Jang D to draw the game by just locking the entire thing up. Yeah, that's one thing I'm trying to figure out too, like as I'm kind of evaluating this position and why Sam is immediately playing h4. The one thing I will say though that this helps Sam is that. You know, when we first came out of this position, this bishop on b2 was kind of an outsider, meaning that there was really no way to go because of this d4 pawn. Well, now white has kind of tempted all of black's pawns to go on dark squares. That bishop on d6 is just as bad as this bishop on b2. In fact, this bishop on b2 can still go to c1 and now attack g5, maybe some sacrifice potential there. So in all of this kind of like slow play, you know, you could argue that Sam is actually still making progress because of, you know, this bishop on d6. Maybe so, but it is, I mean, it is close to being so locked up that, anyone who's better is only symbolically better and basically it's equal. Um, Sam would want to play his knight to like g4, maybe knight f3, h2, g4. But if he ever does, there's bishop h5 from black. So Absolutely, yeah. So he plays g4 to stop bishop h5, but now his knight also doesn't have the g4 square. <clears throat> I'm thinking right. Sam probably doesn't have the most experience playing the bird opening. <laughs> 
And this is definitely, uh, you know, one of the first questions that, you know, Sam is asking Zhang Di and kind of like all of this king side tension with this move rook h2, because he's starting to play this idea of h takes g5. And, you know, should if the queen weren't on h7, black might want to respond h takes g5, but if he responds f takes g5, well, now this pawn on f5 becomes a passed pawn. And on top of that, maybe he has some break with f6, where he clears that f5 square for a rook or a knight, where it's going to be hard for black to play around with less space. Yeah, I don't think black wants to play FG, just like you're saying. It's too many things that could go wrong. It makes H6 a target forever, because Sam can build up against it with rooks. Um, it makes E5 a target that Sam can attack with his knight, and you know, Zhang Di has a light-squared bishop that's not going to be able to help with E5 or H6 or C5. So black does not want to end up with multiple weaknesses on dark squares for Sam to attack. That's basically the worst possible scenario. Right, and I like this move, by the way, knight to f3, because basically what Sam is say saying is, I can take this pawn on g5 anytime I want. Let me move my king off of the h file, maybe put my f1 rook on h1, and so that way when I open the h file, your queen is on g7 in the way of everything, and white's pieces are already there, ready for the attack. So I really like the discipline here with this idea of knight f3, maybe king g2 next, rook h1. He might even have time to bring his king like all the way to e1 if he really wanted to. Uh, might, and black but I think, really has nothing I think, to do. I think the big threat is something else here from Sam. I think the big threat is actually queen to e1. We'll see if I'm right. We'll see if that happens. So what's your idea with queen to e1? To play queen to a5. And then bishop a3. and Stretch on both sides of the board. Yeah, because black's already committed their queen to covering the h-file. They don't yet have the rooks to cover the h-file, and the rooks aren't defending each other, right? They're on different right. ranks. So it's not as easy to challenge the h-file with the rooks. But the queen is like the only piece that's really good at, at helping defend c5 and c6 along with the bishop. So, um, looks yeah, like now we see your idea of queen e1, by the way. What's that? Now we see your idea of queen e1, and it makes yeah. even more sense now because that black king is on e7, where it's in the heart of all of you know black's pieces. It's going to be very hard to coordinate around this. Yeah, I mean, bishop a3, queen a5 just wins that pawn already, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, bishop over. a3 first doesn't matter. And there's yeah. always this you know, idea of maybe white can take on h takes g5. So black already having two minutes not only has to juggle all this queen side pressure, he has to balance that with the king side pressure as well. I mean, this is Karpov in its finest playing on both sides of the board. It really looked like Sam was just going for the h file or a sack on g5. And so Jung D's response is logical. He's like, I'll evacuate my king from that side of the board. But actually, that side of the board is where Zhang Di had the best chance to hold. It was like locked and like no big weaknesses. On the queen side, he's got a7, c6, c5. That's not really where you want to hide your king. And Sam always has the b4 break if like the black king were on b8 for some reason. Sam could always play b4 and just open for an attack over there. So honestly, it's a it's not a surprising reaction to run that way with the king, but I think it's the wrong reaction. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not even sure... Are there any yeah, questions sure. about what's going to happen to the C5 pawn here? Or, or does everybody see that Queen A5 is unstoppable? Yeah, and while we're waiting for our audience to kind of ask us questions about that, you know, I think I don't even think this idea of King D7 was intended to just run the king over to the queen side. I think this was out of necessity, given the fact that that queen on G7 was blocking all of those other pieces from coming in as well kind of highlighting that lack of coordination. And, you know, we touched on it a little bit, this fish fund D6. Once all these pawns got locked down on dark squares, it makes it very difficult for black to kind of survive in this limited space. Rook H8. So he's still, maybe he's thinking like he's going to play H5 for some last ditch um, counterplay. I mean, Sam could even play H5 here and then just win with queen A5 later, right? If he wanted to like just completely close that side of the board if he were worried about H5. Right. I mean, regardless, I think Black is still making like the best decision here. You have to blow up in the position now. You have to get your counterplay. And if you're worse, you're just worse. But you yeah. know, you'll live on, live to play on another day. And you know, here we're going to see. Maybe he's going to try to go for h takes g4, open up that h file, make that king on h1 feel weak. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I was maybe wondering: Does White have time to bring that king over to e1 so these rooks could be in perfect harmony? Mm -hmm. And all of these kind of counterplay ideas from Black just don't exist. But I think White is doing spectacular here, anyways. Yeah, I mean, I think like since he had that opportunity to play queen e1 to a5 when black couldn't do anything about it, um, it was important to do that. Um, he did it at a moment where black couldn't play successfully bishop c7 to keep his queen out because the bishop needed to defend c5 against the bishop on a3. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can pass up a chance that good. Right, and here we go. Bishop takes c5, and now the, now the cookie starts to crumble a little bit, so... H takes G4. Well, maybe Bishop takes D6 is a good insertion here, I think, for white. Then either the black king gets drawn out to D6, or 
Rook takes d6, and there's always this idea of queen c7, and then picking up the c6 pawn as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we'll probably see bishop takes d6 check here. Right. I think bishop takes d6, rook takes d6, and then maybe like rook takes g4 here for white, because then black can't even break open, because g takes h4 would obviously hang that queen on g7. Yeah, if white uh, played probably. just rook takes g4, I think the move black's looking at is bishop h5. Yeah. Um, going after the knight, it would probably force rook to g3. And then black could trade on f3 and then take on h4. Right. Okay. Right. And they would sort of open things up a little bit on that side of the board. So, um, yeah. So Sam's going to play bishop d6. On king d6, he'll probably play queen a3. Um, queen a3 is really strong here. Queen uh, either forcing c5 or king c7. Yeah. Although, I don't know. Maybe he's, maybe he's got more than one option of what comes next. This one's looking pretty tight, but another one that I think is looking tight as well is actually a Kobian's game against Shliotenko here, where Shliotenko already has about one minute and 20 seconds left. Uh, oh. And it looks like a Kobian, you know, he has a material advantage. He just needs to be safe here and make sure he doesn't accidentally hang a mate. Oh, look, on move 25, he found this tactic, bishop g4. And if the queen moves, the bishop on d7 is undefended. So this was not exactly what Shliotenko wanted to do. This was not like a deliberate queen sack. It was like a... You made me do it by uh, <laughs> by getting in there. Right. And this is what happens when both players play statically and one player is just clearly better. You're, you're not changing the dynamic of the game. And, you know, if you play, if you have the static advantage and you continue to play statically and you eliminate your opponent's resources, you, you eventually get like a material advantage. And here we see it with this idea of Bishop G4. So, yeah, he's got a minute. Var is doing some thinking, taking it seriously, not just waiting for the queen to win on her own. Yeah, and this is pretty good technique, I think, here by VAR. I mean, a lot of beginner players, you know, especially in these live club matches where it's 7-1 to one and you just want to score that point for your team and move on to the next round, might be tempted to just start moving pieces really quickly here. But VAR has got a lot of different options. You know, he can consider, like, ideas like rook a7. You know, he wants to make sure that rook f8 is not going to give black a lot of counterplay. But he knows that he's going to win if he handles this correctly. So this is really good technique for, you know, some of our beginner players out there who might not understand the advantage of having more time on the clock. So what what could happen here? Rook to a7, then maybe rook f8 to f7 to try and not lose that pawn yet. But I don't know. I don't know if the rook could actually hold it because the white queen can sort of come there as well, right? Queen e7, rook f7, queen d8, and it looks like c7 would still drop. So, okay, f4 was played. Yeah, and f4 is pretty strong too because this knight really liked the c5 square. And while white is basically giving up the c4 pawn, now queen takes g6 comes in. This rook's going to go into a7. And if this rook on e8 were to ever leave the seventh rank, rook to a8 check and the game just lights out. So the Kobian yeah. should be able to get the point here and move on to the next round. Yeah, I mean, there's some potential counterplay with rook e2 and knight e3 um, or knight d2 even could be a better square. So you can come to f3. Um, that's a very good way to coordinate with the rook and create unpleasantness. But it seems impossible to play those moves without allowing rook a8 checkmate. So, so I don't quite see, I don't quite see that developing fast enough for Robert. Right, and the, the problem with the rooks in these kind of positions where you're trying to get counterplay is that rooks are very clumsy pieces. So when black plays rook to e2 check here, I think white can just put that king on g1, and black has no way of hitting the dark squares. He's going to have to go back to e8, and that's going to be a you know basically a full on, you know, resignation for all intents and purposes. Yeah. All right, rook a2 was played as if rook e2 was a problem, which who knows? Who knows? Um, so the knight comes to e3. Is he going to grab the pawn on d5? That might improve his drawing chances or annoying chances, right? Make things tough on var. So here, here might be var, var's idea. So after knight e3, maybe king to g1, knight takes mm -hmm. d5. Maybe he's looking at this idea of playing f5, and now he's threatening f6 followed by queen g7 mate. And that pawn is actually kind of annoying to stop. You know, once it gets to the f6 square, because black doesn't have a dark squared bishop, he only has a light squared bishop. So maybe he's right. giving up this pawn for a concrete idea. And so, for example, uh, here knight takes d5, followed by f5, there's rook f2 as well. So there's no rookie one check with perpetual ideas. And I think that's why we're actually seeing this idea of knight f5. I think Robert just realized just this is a really strong idea. And Shanklin has actually just won his game against Jean D, kind of what we suspected would happen. It actually was made on the board here. We wow. take a quick look with queen to f8 mate. 
Um, yep. So we had queen a3, c5, like we thought. Then Zhang Di played his idea on the king side, successfully opening things up. Um, and basically, Sam chooses to let the h file open, not the g file, because actually, he's the one who controls the h file at first. So it may not even help Zhang Di that much to weaken his king. This g pawn needs to get out of the way of blocking the queen. So it comes running in. Some checks. Oh, rook h5 is a genius move, right? Stopping queen g5 with perpetual ideas. That keeps right. the queen locked in for one extra move. g3 has to be played as well. And Sam's queen can creep in a little bit closer. And a little bit closer. And yeah. Yeah, and kind of as we said before, I mean, Black was trying to open up the h file there to get counterplay. But if anything, he just opened up the h file for white, and white was able to get made on the board. I mean, it looks like queen g4 kind of like hung a mate in one, but it's actually already very difficult to find moves there. Uh, yeah, I mean, once the, the queen can't move because he's doubled on this eighth rank, I mean, Sam's going to have multiple ways to to finish this position off. Uh, the black pieces, neither of them can move, basically because of checkmates in one or two that can happen. So, yeah. And uh, Robert has just resigned as well. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting. He just sacrificed his queen for the rook so he could pick up the knight, which was undefended, and then just won the rook versus bishop yeah. ending. Yeah, and this is pretty easy to win this endgame since he's got two extra pawns on the king side. I mean, he can kind of finish it off however he wants. So, so yeah. So, no massive upset today, right? I right. Think, uh, and this, this, will time, be the this time, this 2,600, 2,700 GMs with white are going to beat the, the youngsters. Yeah, and this is the first time we will actually see a rematch in the knockout battles, meaning the first time that a live club match has occurred, followed by a rematch of that live club match game. But I think as fans of the game, we're all rooting for Sam Shanklin to play a version of Kobian in this, what, what should be a pretty meaningful game here. Shlietenko will play Zhang Di. It will be the final knockout battle for you know all four, uh, all four players heading into the summer series. Um, you know, which matchup are you, you you excited for? Are you excited for kind of like the rematch of the veterans here? Or, you know, kind of a test for the youngsters in terms of what might they show next year in the Pro Chess League? I guess, um, you know, like uh, like some people get the money sign about uh, getting excited about, about bags of money. Like I get excited about rating points a little bit. And so I'm sort of like, ching, like 2,700 versus 2,650, you know, people who like meet each other in the U.S. championships. Um yeah, that's that's kind of like what I'm more excited to see. Um, also, Verushin has won two knockouts already, right? Yeah, he's our definitive so knockout champion. He's one game away from winning all three. I, uh, you know, obviously he's helped by that advantage that his uh, fans are giving him by giving him white in his first game here against Sam. But um, it would be interesting to see if if uh, if you know a player over 2700 can knock him off of like just winning every single knockout or will he go a perfect three for three in division a i mean that would be pretty insane <laughs> i have to I say one thing that's definitely helped the bar as well as when he has these whites he converts he doesn't just draw and then need the tiebreaker because against these youngsters that's where that bullet tiebreaker can become a very dangerous game i'll be curious to see what sam's strategy is here does he try to win with black from the get-go or does he actually decide to try to just play solidly take the game to a tiebreaker if needed and then just assume maybe I'm faster than VAR and I could be able to outplay him to get first for San Francisco in this knockout battle. Yeah. Sam's just quickly asking me about some details of the rules there, like, you know, who, what color does who have in an Arm Armageddon bullet game? So he's probably thinking about that same question as you. What's, you know, what's his strategy? Like, how bad is the bullet game going to be versus the 15-minute game? Which is it for him to do? Right, and that's a really tough test, I think, to gauge so early in this tournament format. We've only seen one knockout battle go into this tiebreaker, and that was Danya, Daniel Nerditsky, that is, for the San Francisco Mechanics, playing against Jean D, where that 1,000 rating point difference, you know, to be fair, kind of showed a little bit in bullet. Uh, and that's that's a really tough sample size to kind of say, like, I'm putting my bet on that. I think I can win, you know, in the bullet format. So it'll be a very interesting strategic choice here uh, to see what Sam Shanklin does. Yeah. I think also, you know, what will be interesting for me, you know, as a fan of the Pro Chess League, is watching the third place matchup as well. The San Diego Surfers, of course, got relegated during the Pro Chess League season, a year removed from winning the Pacific Division in 2018. But we haven't really seen them make a statement so far in the in the, um, in the summer series. Obviously, they still have their live club match next after this matchup. 
But yeah. if Shlyutenko can beat Zhang Di, who's a pretty strong board four, this might be Shlyutenko's way of signaling to Keaton Kira, the San Diego Surfers general manager, hey, put me in next season. I can be your yeah. anchor on board four and make a statement when, when it really counts. So um, yeah. that's going to be interesting for me to watch as well as a dialogue going into the you know, Protest League qualifiers, which should happen later this I mean, I think, I think good board fours are kind of rare. Like most, most uh, regular season Protest League matches, you see the board fours go 0-3 and then play against each other most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time, right? So like, right. If, you have, if you have one of these, uh, if you have one of these board fours that's like really likely to beat other fours, board fours, that's already something. But the ones that are like, hey, I can score against like, you know, an occasional upset against the GMs and beat the other team's board four. That's kind of rare and that's huge. I mean, that's like what, you know, Tbilisi had that and uh, Armenia had that. And New that, York that had that. Those yeah. teams, right. That they were getting like two points out of four and sometimes more from their fourth boards. Yeah, I mean, the one that comes out to mind is Grant Jew for the New York Marshals during the and during Grant's the regular season, scoring three out of four, I believe, against the St. Louis Archbishops, drawing Caruana, Wesley So, and then beating Hans Niemann. And I believe yeah. he was playing Josh Bloomer or, you know, on Rosenthal, their board four. Yeah. Or Rosenthal, yeah. But three out of four, you know, fantastic. Uh, yeah. These board fours really make a difference. So for these teams yeah. that maybe aren't sending their best lineups, for them, it's a proving ground. Like, how good are my players? This is a test. I think we only saw Shlietenko play once during the Pro Chess League season in the Battle Royale. I think he got two and a half out of seven. Mm -hmm. But... You know, here we go, and you know he's going to be playing in the third place match against a very, you know, I would say seasoned pro chess league player, despite his age. Yeah, and he, I mean, he also has experience. He played in like the Conic on Chess Kid for uh, several years. Um, he played in the Chess Kid games this year, so he's got a lot of experience playing these online competitions. He's been playing them since he was like you know six or seven years old, um, and I think he's got like a good sort of learning attitude of just getting better he's like you know fine trying to beat people lower than him he's fine trying to learn when he plays against people better than them you know no real like psychological weaknesses for somebody that young and uh, a lot of potential so i want to draw our attention actually back to that st louis versus san diego game because i see that var and robert are actually talking in the chat right now uh, mm -hmm. and var said that uh good game but when you took on f4 you had g5 g4 x clam i think it was very strong uh for black uh of course Robert was playing black in that game and went on to lose. Then but why do you take on F4 quickly, Bar? <laughs> I saw it in one second that G5, G4 was good. What? There, he didn't have some brilliant plan that we didn't see? Yeah, I mean, that was one thing I was kind of curious about because black played a really rare opening, but white was playing as if like he had prepared for this line as well and expected this variation. But G5, G4 seemed kind of dangerous, and maybe just the speed at which Jacobian decided to take on F4 scared Robert. Like bluffed and him off of it? I mean, maybe bluffed him. I mean, we see this kind of stuff all the time in the pro chess league where like a really strong player, his confidence is worth maybe an extra point on that scoreboard just because he's able to trick his opponents uh, into, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, that would explain being the knockout King. If you can like bluff people off of stuff, just you're so sure in your element. Yeah, for sure. And like Tanko saying, Hmm, maybe, yeah, it looks like it. Well, <laughs> but, but what were you looking at the whole time after bar played queen F4? I mean, honestly, it might just be nerves. I mean, this is, again, the Pro Chess League Summer Series debut for, you know, for the youngster. I believe he's the number two highest rated 11-year-old in the United States or 13-year-old in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe just the nerves got the best of him, not having had a lot of Pro Chess League experience in this format. But, you know, we talk about knockout kings, and we're going to be looking at Verusia Nakobian playing Sam Shankland in the knockout yeah. battles here. So shout out to the 2,600 of you guys watching the Pro Chess League Summer Series here. Well, both on chess.com and on the Twitch channel. If you're watching us on the chess.com homepage, make sure to tune in to the actual Twitch stream by clicking that little Twitch button. Follow the chess.com channel so you can get all the notifications when the Pro Chess League Summer Series goes live. Let me just say, Var better not bluff G5, G4 against Sam Shanklin. Because <laughs> Sam is going to check anything he does. There's not going to be <laughs> there's not going to be something like, oh yeah, I lost a pawn and then I didn't even look at my one aggressive move. There's going to be none of that from Sam. No, no forgiveness there. If he might not bluff like G, uh, G5, G4, but maybe a chance that he plays the Shirov Gambit here goes for the G4, G5 from White, just get it in the reverse. I would be shocked. <laughs> I would be shocked. I think his opening went well last game, so he should go for an exchange on D5 here. Yeah, and right? I wonder Knight what that extra five minutes will mean. D5 is how the last game went. I, I mean, we missed the opening, so. Right, okay. well, the games are underway here. For Moscow. Moscow is also a fine opening choice for, for VAR. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. If you look at that last game they played, it felt like VAR had the upper hand through the whole game. 
and uh, you know, position with very, very little activity for Sam until the final flurry of tactics, which were merely to sort of like equalize a bad end game. Right. The only threat Sam made the entire game. So I would say repeat that opening if you could, right? Just play a C takes D5. Yeah, for sure. And it's going to be interesting what both players do with that extra five minutes in this game and how they plan to improve from that initial game. I'm sure Sam has other ideas that he'll want to play as Black. I mean, to have Black twice against the same, you know, strong GM and, you know, one night in this, in this format, it's a really tough task. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what he does here. Yeah, I mean, Sam's a uh, super prepped player. He's got uh, he's got a host of openings that you know he knows and studies and that he's ready to bring out. So, yeah, I'm sure he knows. I'm sure he knows stuff about this position here. So, for some of our players, or maybe E4 players, or aren't as familiar with like the different Slav variations, I'm not sure what you, you, your opening background was, but I'm certainly not a you know, a mainline Slav player. I kind of cop out with the exchange Slav, you know, when I do play it. Uh, you want to walk through our, you know, our, our lower rated audience in terms of like what White's ideas are here? In this position here? Yep. Um, so in this one, White's gained space in the center in exchange for the Bishop pair. Black spent time on that H6 move and White just sort of cashed it in, gained, gained the advantage in the center. So usually the key to this position, well, there's a couple keys, but I mean, White wants to keep their space advantage, and they also want to look in particular to set up like a really good square for one or both knights. Because if you can keep your knights like super well outposted, then the bishop pair will never be better than them. And at some point, black will be forced to trade a bishop for an outposted knight. And then you'll keep your space advantage, and they won't have the bishop pair. Um, so, you know, knight e4 to c5 is a maneuver you see sometimes, and that's one reason you don't see Sam playing knight to b6. Is because it just clears the way for knight to c5 for white. Right. That actually uh, reminds me of a book that was written by another pro chess league player, uh, Mauricio Flores, who plays for the Minnesota Blizzard. This idea of knight e4 to knight c5, and the idea there is you want to be able to control this d6 square, even with an idea like b takes c5. And it looks counterintuitive because you're blocking the d file, but then this knight on f3 hops into e5, and now you have full control over the d6 square. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that's also, you don't see any e4 here, which white could do for more space technically in the center. But e4 would block his bishop and like block his knight. I mean, it's not terrible to play e4. It's some center space, but it's not, I guess, White's main idea in this particular position. So, right. And the one I think drawback of playing e4 in a position like this is you're looking at how does Black develop his pieces. And Black would love to play a move like b6 followed by bishop b7 or bishop a6. But the problem is the c6 pawn gets really weak. And so when you play a move like e4, you're blocking the bishop, which would be able to control that long light square diagonal. Obviously, in this yeah. position, black can't play b6 because the c6 pawn would just drop. But structurally, you kind of want to avoid this conflict between the bishop and the, and the e4 pawn. Yeah, I mean, there could be some position where after b6, queen c6, black has bishop a6, hitting your rook, and then rook a to c8, maybe trapping your queen. But in answer to your question, what does black want to do? The real answer is e5, and Sam just confirmed that as well. That was the answer I would have given, and it's the answer Sam gave. He played for e5. He wanted to be in a position when he played e5 where if white played d5, he would have like knight b6 working out for him. Um, and so, yeah, so now he's got that trade that, um, he's got that trade there, simplifying a little bit some of the pressure in the center. And uh, now it's, you know, it's still this question of getting the bishop out from defending b7. Yeah, and this is one of those moments where I think Black needs something concrete because if White could just make a couple moves in a row, like a4, a5, a6, I could see Black getting in a lot of trouble on this light square diagonal. And that's why we're seeing this move work to b8 here, getting ready to play maybe like a b6 or a b5 or a b6 and then a c5 in the, in the long run so White can't just kind of control all the space on the queen side. I think he might even just bring out his bishop and leave the rook defending the pawn for the moment. The thing is, I think like an alternative for Black is a move like queen e7, let's say, right? Right. Um, that defends the B pawn and, you know, stays on a dark square. But then white can play rook D1, which just gives white some more like aggressive options for what they can do, right? So I think that's why Sam preferred this move rook B8. It's like, well, my rook's not doing anything else anyway. Let's use my rook instead of my queen. Keep the D file under, under observation so white doesn't continue to increase his activity. Right. Yeah, I think one thing that Black is going to have to think about in the long run is where exactly does he want to put this bishop on c8? Because generally when you have a pawn on g6, you don't really want to put the bishop on f5 because if it gets kicked, it has to go backwards the way that it came from. 
And you don't exactly want to play bishop d7 or bishop e6 here either, giving up, you know, your bishop pair, um, you know, in, in various cases. So I think, you know, it, it could be a little bit tricky here for black to kind of navigate some of this pressure that white's applying with the knight on c5. Yeah, I think the key is black has to find a chance to put the bishop on f5 or or g4 or something at some point where if white plays moves like e4 or h3 or f3, they kind of block in his own bishop on g2. And then you're even willing to retreat all the way back to c8, right? So like, right. for example, I'll take back king g7 for a second to show the idea. I play bishop f5, let's say white plays e4. I play bishop g4, white plays h3. And then I come all the way back to c8. If that's killed some of white's pressure against my queen side, then cool, you know? I just move right. my bishop around in circles, but I don't mind because white's little pawn moves haven't actually helped them maybe, just weakened him. But what you have to watch out for is black, if you're going for this, is that white doesn't play f4 and then e5 in response yeah. and get like a whole like rolling thing with that pawn structure becoming a mobile majority on the king side. Um, you would need some kind of counter like queen d4 check and know that somehow this position is acceptable uh, before you would go for that. Yeah, positionally, might, you kind of want to... Oh, sorry about that. But yeah, positionally, you kind of want to avoid like this grip where white plays f4 and then e5 and then even considers h4, h5 because now black has the minority on that side of the board. And if white can ever engineer a trade on f5 or on e6, it becomes very easy to break open black's king and really expose the weaknesses there. Yeah. And look, Sam finally played this move queen e7 as soon as he did. Bar took the d file like, yep, I was in the market for a d file. <laughs> there we go. I guess he was going to take it anyway. That's probably the meaning behind queen b3, which we were explaining something when Var played queen b3. But in response to king g7, he played the sort of quasi-retreating move queen b3. And I'd been expecting a move like queen b3 or queen c2. And on queen c2, there's maybe bishop f5. So he went queen b3, and he gets the file. Right. Oops. And I really like this move a5. Yeah, but something in mind, too. Fighting for the dark squares. This knight outpost is going to come to d3. Yeah, and I'm curious like how strong this knight will be in the long run on d3. Anish Giri actually referred to this kind of kingside pawn structure in the knight on d3 in one of his previous interviews is like the Ulf Anderson knight, where it's actually able to control all these dark squares. But here it just looks like Bar was more than content getting the dark square to bishop off of the board and saying b7 and c6 are both on light squares. Your bishop is worse than mine. Let's go. Yeah, and Sam could not grab this pawn on e2, I think. He didn't, he didn't look at it for too long, given that he's got 12 minutes on the clock. But on queen takes e2, I think just queen d6 is super annoying. White yeah, for just sure. gains control of all the central dark squares. You know, you're reduced to a move like rook a8, and he's got queen d4. And uh, it's pretty awkward for black, I think. So Yeah, black's Sam got tactical problems to cure too. I mean, he's going to have to keep an eye on this bishop takes c6 threat and make sure the queen and the rook are always coordinated so it's not possible. Mm-hmm. So Sam was content to just get a square for his bishop with bishop e6. Bar saves his e-pawn with e3. And Sam throws the c-pawn off the board. It's not clear to me immediately who has the advantage in this structure. I guess I would think that black's okay, actually. Yeah, the theme, I think, for black in terms of counterplay in both games has been the tale of the c-pawn, right? And that's been black's kind of golden ticket back into the game. The first one for equality, and this one maybe for an advantage if you can get in like rook c8, c4, c3 really start to you know squeeze white it's tricky because as soon as he does this like b7 becomes like nigh untenable so right. it's very committal when he goes for it but at the moment var's not in position to play f4 e4 f5 kind of moves i feel like if white had an advantage var play this very you know minimalist e3 move very like stable and and safe here with e3 but i feel mm -hmm. like if white were to really have an advantage in this position it would have to be to move his kingside majority. I mean, I don't think you're going to win by attacking the queen side. Right. In a simplified position like this, I, I don't quite feel like that's likely. Oh, Sam just if gets the beep on the b6. I guess it's okay there. He can't play c4 at the moment, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I actually kind of like this decision for black because it actually slows down white from his only counterplay option of like maybe going for a5 and trying to generate like a, a pass pawn on the a file while like isolating this b, b7 pawn artificially. Mm -hmm. Now at least black is a little bit more connected. His pawns are in dark squares now, which is very different than before. And I really like this idea of h5. Sam's been using this idea in almost every single game he's played tonight. h5, h4, trying to generate you know weaknesses. Now maybe his bishop goes to g4. Maybe he tries to look for like a favorable exchange of light squared bishops if it comes up. 
Sam's creating a lot of opportunities here for himself. We have to ask ourselves about this move A5, because that's sort of what the Rook C1 move partly signals is like, hey, am I going to play A5? If Sam takes on A5, Verusian can't take on C5 with the Rook, which he would like to because his Queen's already attacked. Right. So he would have to take with his Queen, and Sam could trade, trade, and get his past A pawn to A4, Rook A5, Bishop B3. It would probably be not that bad for Var. Maybe drawish or something. Yeah, and here he actually takes an A5 five. square. He did go for A5, and he played the simpler recapture on A5 with his queen instead of on C5. Um, but here also, the past C pawn looks tenable at the moment. Yeah, I mean, this actually looks fine for black. I mean, if he plays C4 and then, like, well, obviously you don't want to drop your queen here, but in the long run, if he can play this move C4, you know, I think it becomes very difficult for white to, you know, defend because his extra pawn is this E3 pawn. That E3 pawn is not going to be passed anytime soon, nor can it actually like generate any counterplay mm -hmm. on the uh, on the king side. So it's going to be tough, I think, for Akobian. Yeah, maybe the evaluation. The more I think about it, you know, I gradually get a bead on the evaluation. Maybe it's just equal because it's hard for Sam to advance the C pawn. Like his queen is on a very important square, controlling the center. He could get really weak on the dark squares if white somehow took over the line diagonal with queen c3 if he wandered off somewhere. But as long as his queen's on e5, I don't see how he advances the, the c pawn. There's queen yeah. c3 anyway, just going for that end game. Now we're going to get a test, right? I mean, does he want to trade queens or not? I think he kind of have to go towards training queens here. Yeah. But the good news is black is the one who's playing for two results. And, you know, worst case, I mean, Sam's getting a bullet game with white. And let's face it, draw odds in a bullet game is not the worst thing that, you know, you could have in a tiebreaker. Yeah, we haven't seen tons and tons of those bullet games yet. We saw Dan Danya win one bullet game with White, where his opponent had drawn odds. Right. I don't think Danya even needed the White there to, you know, be able to convert against you know, uh, you know, his much lower rated opponent. But you know, here let's talk about like what Black can do to try to avoid having to even go to that tiebreak game, right? I mean, it seems to me like Black's king has a more direct pass to the center, and then the question becomes, right. then what? I mean, the, the, there's no way to get through the center because d4, e4, f4 is impassable. So the plan for black would be to have to bring the king to b4, I think. That's the only plan I would see. Um, it's not so clear how white stops that with the passive rook there on c3. It's true. The, different, the, the relative activity versus passivity of the two rooks makes things seem kind of nice for black, actually. Bishop f1, is it going to e2 then to let the white king then crawl along the first rank? This does feel like white's kind of kind of you know on the ground. Yeah, and I, I think another point there of bishop to f1 also is you know black's gonna also have to consider how does his king cross over to the b file. I think if he plays a move like rook c5 and then plays like his king up to e5 and then d6, c6, king b5, he can start to work around. And that's why we're seeing e4 here. Might maybe with the idea of f4. So it's harder for black to make that connection without having to go all the way, you know, to c8 while the rook's on c7. Yeah, I mean, I think the king was always headed to e7, d6, c5. But um, it's interesting to see Var finally, you know, going for it, activating this uh, this majority. And I wonder about the possibility of Sam playing rook b8 to b3. So we should up oh, calculate it. Now Sam's faster than us. Um, the idea is that on bishop takes c4, he would have rook c8, winning back material. Um, and if not, he wants to play rook b3. Maybe. I mean, rook b2 might be playable too, but rook b3, rook b3, c takes b3, and that pawn becomes really hard to stop, right? Right, and I think this idea was actually really well-timed because if black wants to continue playing for two results, if you were to go with this king walk idea that we were discussing earlier with white's move e5, white's king is faster to getting a d4, so rook b8 forced white to kind of mix things up, and now this is going to give black a little bit more time to bring that king maybe to like a c5 square where he can start to talk about making progress by using this king and his bishop in conjunction. Yeah, okay, so Var avoids going to that B pawn position, which looked, oh yeah, it was losing actually. It wasn't just like tough to stop, it was actually losing. I'll just show everybody real quick. Like the only way to cover this thing is to put the bishop on this diagonal, but there's no way to stop uh, Sam just playing bishop f5 right. to win that endgame because of his control of the white squares. So he had to back up with rook c2. Now he's finally threatening bishop takes c4. So Sam has to either play rook b4 or pawn c3. Neither seems very desirable because the white king is suddenly getting to d4 really fast. So I think that I think that VAR is good here. I think f4, e5 was in time. 
And now he's activated his king before Sam's king. If Sam's king were on c5, I would like Sam's position. But here he might just go rook b3, check, king f2, rook b4, and, and call it a call it a bullet game. Right, and it's kind of funny how like the evaluation of our you know our evaluation of the position changed throughout that because we're immediately reacting to the fact that well if black can't trade rooks with this pass pawn being an immediate threat well we look at it on the flip side this is not an opposite colored bishop ending this is the same colored bishop ending where all of black's pawns are in light squares and that can be problematic at times um, for white and usually you know if you're trying to play for a win you you avoid that situation altogether um, so yeah I mean it, it's tricky now I think we might just be going into a bullet tie break which is you know, I think the game is that maybe the fans want to see. Yeah, I mean, we, we'd we be happy to hear from you fans how you feel about this format. And, you know, if you like the bullet games, if you like the 1-1 format, if you like the if you like the 15-minute games or the 1-minute games, et cetera, good to, good to know as we guess at what the fans might want to watch. Uh, should we check the fourth board game or should we just see if they agree to a draw first and then go over there? Well, if they agree to a draw, I think their bullet game starts immediately. So let's take a quick peek at uh, how Zhang Di is doing against Shliotenko here, because right. I could sense that this position might Let's actually be heating it. up a little bit. Um, yeah. This king on c2 is kind of weak, and I think this is the first time that we've seen Zhang Di in trouble. And as we say that, by the way, uh, we do have a draw between Shanklin and Akobian, which means their bullet game will be starting yeah. any second. All right, so we'll keep our eyes peeled for that bullet game about to start. <clears throat> yeah, the white king does not look perfect. Bishop b5 seems like a way to... Try and poke at it some more. A5, A4. It's been the theme Maybe of the another night. Another way. So if black plays A5, white probably plays A4, which might, might lock things a little bit. Overall, I like I like Robert's position, actually. Yeah, I, I have to say I like his position, too. And this knight on H7, even though it feels misplaced, it's always coming back in the game, too, with either knight G5 or knight F6. So Jean D has a lot of problems to solve and a lot less time to do it. All right, so um, so yeah, I mean, it's not if you like Flax position too, then it means it's not just the crazy Benoni guy inside of me talking. Well, I've been studying those positions too, so I might be biased as well. Okay. So yeah, man. I guess the one Rob's thing that giving it, it a good think. Yeah, I mean, that was one thing I was about to comment on is I think, you know, the one thing that white is doing a good job of is it's not 100% clear what is black do next. As we mentioned, a5, white could play a4, this b3 pawn is covered, you can't really sack, do you want to sacrifice the exchange? Like, these are things that involve concrete calculation. And, you know, we see these kind of moments all the time in the protest league in this kind of rapid format where it's actually a curse to have this time to think because now you're you're tortured with like the spoils of a good position and where do you go next? I've seen tortured time with a good position, huh? I mean, I've seen it time and time again where these strong players they you know they get a great position against a twenty four hundred rated player and then you know before they know it, they've got two minutes left and that advantage is no more and you know well, I gotta say the protest league so great. I gotta say, if good positions are torture to someone, then maybe they shouldn't play chess because that's kind of the highlight of chess. It's not going to get much better than having a good position. Right, but that's where that experience of like being an over-the-board player and then trying to be an online rapid player, that's where we really see that difference. And some grandmasters have really excelled at that, and we've also seen some grandmasters struggle with that time, you know, that time difference, especially in cases where they're playing not in their time zone and like these really bizarre hours that we see during the Pro Chess League. All right, after two minutes of thumb twiddling, he played the obvious Bishop B5 Benoni move, making progress on the queen side, and White's king happens to be there, which just makes it better. Maybe that's why I like this Benoni position. It's like a Benoni where your opponent's king is on the queen side while you get your <laughs> while you get your queen side counterplay. That's like perfect, huh? Yeah, I mean, to, to make that even better for black, I mean, usually when you have this light squared bishop, you want to play bishop g4 and then take that knight on f3. Here, mm -hmm. this bishop on d7, which is usually kind of an annoyance for black, is actually like a really impressive resource because of this bishop b5 idea, just kind it of breaking probably, things a little bit. He was probably checking a3. That's probably why he took some time there. He was because he was sort of a little committal, a little committal to play bishop b5 on a3. He's going to have to sack an exchange. So he was probably checking that, which is good due diligence. I have to approve, actually. Right. And when you have like a three minute edge and you have the better position, you have to check these things. And, you know, it, it's really good technique and experience. Like it shows that he has experience in this format, which is great for him. Yeah. So that bullet tiebreak yeah. should be starting any minute now, uh, and that would be between Sam Shankland and Verusha Nakobian. I don't think we've seen a lot of, you know, bullet games from these two players. So it'll be interesting to see how they do in the one plus one format. Sam Shankland will yeah. have white, but Verusha will have draw odds. The previous two games are draws, so I'm know, gonna add gonna... to that, Isaac. Like they don't play bullet. Like neither of these guys plays bullet. 
I mean, well, hopefully, like for a start, they both have like some sort of mouse, right? These guys never do. Yeah, in that sense, it's balanced. Like their bullet experience is very here we go. Here it is. All so right. E4 here, and we're going to get a French. So, going to get a French. Repeat the same opening that he lost within that first live club match. VAR played knight f6 instead of c5. So, he went for a more complicated position, um, which surprises me because I would think with the draw odds, he would want that sort of simpler, stabler IQP position. Maybe losing it was just too much, though, to then do it again. I mean, I think in these bullet games, I mean, you don't really want to go into a game of bullet thinking that you're going to draw because the percentages of there being draws and bullets to begin with are pretty low. So I think you just have to trust your instincts. If you like an opening, you have to go for it. And here he's already testing Sam with this idea of Queen takes B2. Yeah, bold. Bold, but uh, perhaps within his knowledge, this whole, this whole position. Right. I mean, this actually might get tricky, right? Because if there's a if there's a line that white has to go for to not concede the advantage to black, but it right. requires a three move repetition, that would be the ultimate form of gamesmanship by anybody who's ever played the Pro Chess League Summer Series. Yeah. Now knight d4 is the question. I mean, if knight d4 is not good, then black's probably in trouble. And he did yeah. not go for knight d4, so I would say he's probably oh the rook defends b7 at least. Okay. That was important. So he's not in as much trouble as he thought. I was thinking, you know, like rook e8, rook b7, and it's like, that's rough. That's right. a rough shape to be in. I mean, this is still really tough, I think, for black. I mean, he might, he's already down 10 seconds. The light squares are really weak. White has all the long-range pieces he needs here. This could get mm -hmm. really ugly really quickly if uh, VAR is not careful. Although, here he, What's he has going to keep on here? Okay, so the, the bishop There's is not going to <laughs> The, the queen is on a2 so black yeah. does have time but he needs to pick up the pace now Sh yeah, but sam shankland has twice as much time as uh bar right but he's got knight c3 he's got bishop on f5 hanging he can go for some kind of a tactic here so here we go queen b1 bishop h7 and queen g6 queen g6 this feels like it might be a bit of a well var is actually up in material but i mean okay 30 seconds and bullet that has to be worth more than just like a pawn or two yeah it seems like it seems like Black's winning now, shockingly yeah. winning. I think. I mean, it, it, it's a race against the clock, right? But if if I'm playing, yeah, there we go. And now the idea of rookie one is going to be strong. So G three, you lose this yeah. bishop, and okay, there's got to be a way that Var can at least force a perpetual with nine seconds left. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess the one second increment. If he didn't have the one second increment, he would surely be losing. Yeah, that's that's for sure. But with it, he's surely winning. And here we go. We're. He, he could have gone it. for a three-move repetition. There, yeah, he could have done it right there. there I would have locked it up. I think Var is... Nice. Maybe Var forgot that a draw is simply good enough to win the match, and he's just going to try yeah. to play for the win, which would be equally as impressive if, if he could. It would be quite impressive to just win this position. And I think he's going for mate. I mean, there's ideas of rook g5, full bit rook h4 mate, so you know, Sam has to already be careful. Rook takes g5, a big threat here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is intense. It's mostly intense because Var doesn't know that he can just draw and win. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the irony of it, right? So rook F2. Oh, but he is intensely winning this. This is brilliant. I mean, wow. I, th I think maybe Var knew that he could draw, but he just wants to go for the win. And there we go. A resignation there. And... You've got to be kidding me. There's no way he that there's no way that he didn't take that draw if he knew that a draw would win the everything for him. I mean, maybe. I mean, the adrenaline too. I mean, he played the whole game basically on four seconds left. But that means that VAR has now won all three of the knockout Amazing. battles. Amazing. Every single one. I mean, Ray said it last week. I'm going to say it this week. He's so far got to be the MVP of the Summer Series, and it might stand by the end of the group stage when August 17th comes around. Wow. That's super impressive. He maintained his knockout title. He maintained his knockout title against Sam Shankland. Wow. That's big. That's big. I've already flipped us back to the other game just so that, you know, people don't miss any of the chess, Isaac. But of course, I'm still talking about Var's achievement, which is on my mind. Um, Shinak Tenko is sacked a pawn at some point, but his position still looks, you know, promising in some ways. Right. And it's important to note now that if uh, Chengdu wants to stay competitive, I believe they desperately need to win this game to, to have even a remote chance, right? I mean, well, actually, no, with St. Louis getting five points and Chengdu already playing in a third place match, I think that guarantees that St. Louis wins the group now with Yeah, I think I think VAR has, has ensured that the uh with three knockout wins in a row, I think he's ensured that St. Louis will be first in the division. 
Right. San Francisco now has eight points, which means that Chengdu with nine can afford to lose actually every single game that they play now that I think about it um, and still get second in the group. San Diego, on the other hand, they've got one point. They would have needed a bunch of things to go in their way. I think we have like the, the path to the playoff card there telling us every single thing that they needed to go their way to finish third place. Uh, it looks like they're already locked into fourth, but Chengdu has a chance to, you know, basically for their fans to play with them one more time and a, you know, what should be a fun match in San Diego, a chance to kind of, you know, talk about the tournament that maybe never was for them and uh, try to recuperate and get a win here to end the summer series group A. This position looks great. Robert's got six minutes to enjoy it. I would love to be in Black's position here and just think about rookie two and knight F3 and knight E4. Man, I would be loving it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, white might have an extra pawn, but it comes at a great cost. And that king on C3, we talked about how in these Benoni positions, you never want to castle queenside if you're white. And I mean, we're on move 36 and white's still paying the price for that. Oh, yeah. 94 is delicious. And he played it just as I decided that was a good taste. So now what I was thinking was queen d4, king a3, queen c5 maybe. Um, no, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not as clear. I mean, it's good, but he can keep going back to b2. So he wants to avoid knight c3 coming with check. That's sort of crucial. Right. So what is Robert going to do? Is he going to go knight f2 to play rookie two check? Is he going to go knight c5 with the idea of rookie two and knight a4? Yeah, he's got a lot of options here. I don't blame him for taking a lot of time. And I like this idea of knight, B, knight g3 because it's a forcing move. Knight f2 wasn't actually a forcing move. And now there's this idea of rook to e2 followed by queen takes a1. So the king has to go to a3 here. Mm -hmm. And then he'll play queen c5, not queen h1, I guess. Yeah. Oh, so king, the king two, found the defense. Three. Maybe. But okay, <laughs> he's always still queen takes a1, so black can't be worse. Black can, you know, black. No, but when white gets to seven, collect yeah. queen d3, that's black's really blown up compared to what he had. Then you can't checkmate the king with that knight and two pass pawns. You can even lose, much less not win, much less draw, right? Yeah, that's actually a really good point because after queen b7, king a3, you you would love to be able to play queen e7, but now white can just even block it with like knight d6 or something. And white is actually just completely winning in that position because you've sacrificed a piece for nothing. Yeah. So this has gone badly wrong, actually. This... Yeah, for sure. Now Zhang Di has a chance to, you know, add another win to his resume against a, you know, a much higher rated opponent. And is there anything good for Robert to do anymore? Not especially. I mean, yeah, knight g3 was a very, very bad, bad choice. I yeah, mean, you're I mean, so close to mating and you trade your knight for that rook in the corner. It's, uh, it's... It looked really appealing. I completely missed this idea of king to c3 there. And now, uh, yeah, I mean, I, queen takes d3 is the real, you know, the real tough part, I think, about all of this for for Robert. There's no way to like sack the rook back and like create some sort of perpetual net. So, no, I mean, he could go queen a1, queen e1 if he wanted to try to draw at this point. I mean, that might be the practical thing to do. I mean, you still have the bullet tie break. I know that, you know, San Diego would not have the draw odds in that, but it might be easier to play for a win and bullet from a fresh position with white than to try to take this and just win it. Yeah. Well, we'd get to see two bullet games. So that would be fun. Um, and speaking of time pressure, anybody who wants to play in the match coming after this between Chengdu and San Diego, you guys have, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes to join the match probably. So that matchup starts in 26 minutes, but people are already minutes. registering for the match. So make sure you join the clubs of both the Chengdu Pandas or the San Diego Surfers in what will be their last live club match of the Summer Series uh, before the Summer Series Championship starts. So make sure to go and support your teams one last time uh, you know, before we move on to Group B. All right, so um, Robert did not try for the draw. He's trying instead to win the pawn on h3 and try and play out this end game, which could be insane with the knight and pawns against the rook. Yeah, and I wonder if Robert's maybe looking more at the clock than at the position and thinking like, hey, I just need to hold this, hold my ground and maybe he'll make a mistake. And, and that, that's already like one of the practical mistakes that you can make in this league is taking a game that you were winning and now it's equal and not making the practical decision, just ending the game and 
you know, benefiting your team. Yeah. Okay, well, now there's a threat. So Rook takes C4. So White's going to have to figure out what to do there. <laughs> he wanted to play A5 anyway. <laughs> Once he noticed it defended his queen, that had to be pretty good. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's not a lot of like good forcing moves left for Black. I mean, we're looking at like Queen C1, Queen A1, but this king can either just hide on B4 or you know move up to A4 and then continue moving the A pawn off the board. Uh, yeah. You know, rooks are really clumsy pieces when they're short range. They're long long range pieces. You know, they they want to have space between yeah. the pieces that they're attacking, and this is a perfect case of that because that rook on C3 looks like it should be a very aggressive piece, but it might be way better off on like a square like G2 where it has the range to attack and go you know make a direct hit on the white king. Yeah, but this knight, it's also fine here. This knight plus, plus pawn as a unit. Like, you can't unseat the knight. It's hard to beat the B pawn. You know, so... Okay, Robert came up with something. He thought a little bit, and he came up with something. A maneuver that may still be enough to get him a draw, right? Since the king had to come back. Right. And, and these are really good sneaky attempts, considering jean -D's, you know general time trouble here with 13 seconds, because he's forcing uh, jean -D to be precise. Now, queen takes c4 is the threat. So mm -hmm. king to a4, and he's got to have a lot of trust in you know, his overall intuition here. I mean, one second to make that move. Yeah. Yeah, you can't even really go back and play rook c1, rook a1, as he plays it, of course. Because once the king gets like b4 or b5, there's just no range to go and attack that white king. So, you know, Black doesn't even have a check here on, you know, a D2 or a C3 that would actually help him, you know, create progress. Right. This knight's coming to A3. I think Jangi's trying to uh, trying to win this. He, he doesn't, blame White he doesn't want all. to go to that bullet game, huh? Despite what a tough position he was in all game. Right? Yeah, I mean, it, it really shows, like, what can happen in the battle of, like, two board four type players where, you know, there's a lot of things going on. You have to be precise and you have to constantly look out for what your opponent's resources are. Here, I think uh, Robert's going to throw in rook a1 check and see if he can create any sort of dynamic play after knight a3, maybe queen c1, queen b2, um, and try to make it awkward for uh, make it awkward for white. So white has to like use the limited time that he has. So knight a3, maybe queen c1, queen b4, followed by like queen c6 check. Uh, yep. Really try to ruffle white's feathers. I mean, that seems like it might still he might still have enough to draw it, but he doesn't seem to have enough to push Jung D off the clock. Jung D is holding on to his last seconds quite well here found a check or two. Oh no yeah oh, i was about no. to say i i, I wasn't 100 percent sure but like for a second i was like wait doesn't that just hang the queen yeah and unfortunately for john d that means the chengdu pandas get fourth in this week's knockout battles for them it won't matter too much but oh my goodness amazing have to applaud the effort there from robert to you decide to keep playing maybe it wasn't the practical decision but sometimes non-practical decisions pay off big time here we, here we have it with queen takes b5. Wow, that was amazing. The fans are saying that at some point everybody missed a queen takes c4 option for black. I, I thought we were looking for it every move. Where could we have missed it? I know with the rook takes c4, we were okay because the a5 pawn protecting the queen on b6, but there might have been a moment there where queen takes c4 was possible. Oh, it's this moment here at move 51 that the fan must have been talking about. Queen takes c4 check pawn takes c4 rook b6 and then a7 rook a6 and if a7 there's rook a6 if king a5 rook b1 a7 i mean tactically it sort of worked but i think it might still just lose so in that sense it wouldn't have worked i'm not sure yeah, and this was really good, like, Puzzle Rush-style, like, recognition, I think, from Robert. Understanding that the queen didn't belong in the c-file and needed to have range from this king and by being able to stretch out white's pieces. Once white plays queen c4, there's no chance of bringing this one back because after queen d7, you know, you can play a move like king b4, but then queen d6 comes in, you still lose this knight, you lose the a-pawn, you lose the game. So really good recognition here that by maintaining that distance from, uh, from like, the white king, he was actually able to generate more threats. Yeah, the king had to defend the knight there. So the lesser evil would have been something like king before you're saying, and then queen to d6 check. Yeah, but I mean, even even there, like you're, you're still going to lose this knight on a3, and it's not clear that you're actually going to survive this. No, in fact, you're going to lose. Definitely going to lose. Cool. Amazing. So he was actually winning by the time he played queen d7 check. 
and he probably rightly avoided that queen takes c4 that someone else noticed. Uh, mm -hmm. It was probably like a way to go into a rook up losing endgame. Wow. Nicely so, done. That means right, as a so the surfers pick up another point. Yeah, so that's the end of our, uh, of our KO for tonight. And uh, the big news, Verusha Nakobian wins his third out of three KOs. Next week, finally, somebody else is going to win the KO. Yeah, we're guaranteed uh, to have new teams next week. Yeah. And uh, in case any of you, like, need to leave now and don't watch the San Diego versus Chengdu match, like, we should mention next week, new time. The matches will be in the morning Pacific time. Isaac, is it 8 a.m. Pacific next week? Yeah, I believe it's 8 a.m. Pacific for Group B. And we've got a really interesting mix of four teams, obviously Bot and Bot and a team that everyone who follows the Protest League is familiar with. Two relegated final sides. Four team, like, uh, like Chengdu and St. Louis. Right, two relegated sides with extraordinarily like great fan bases in both the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers and the uh, Reykjavik Pop Fans and the Barcelona Raptors in that mix. So, you right. know, should be a really interesting group. I think it'll be interesting to see how do the three teams not named Bot and Bot and kind of make a statement as they look ahead towards the protest league qualifiers, which are coming up later this fall. Baden Baden is a slight favorite to win that group, but there's definitely chaos potential there. I think with the top players in each of those three teams, who do you like to move out of that group in terms of uh, the top two teams? Um, I mean, I guess I've got to go with the final four team, Baden Baden. I mean, you saw this was a crowded division here, this first division with two top four teams, and they still both managed to make it out of the division. So I got to go with the final four bottom bot and snowballs for one of those spots and then we got the puffins the puffins the puffins or pawn grabbers with a big fan base or the rap or the raptors who started out the season winning like they were like one of the best central teams and then things got worse for them yeah they got relegated um, on like the final game you know, when yeah, they were playing the berlin bears a shocking slide down the standings i guess i would go with uh i guess i would go with the pawn grabbers for second place yeah, it's definitely uh, a tight field there, I think. But anyway, now everybody knows what to come back to next week if they need to. We're going to take our short break. But uh, in minutes, we will be back with the Chengdu Pandas and the San Diego Surfers' last live club match of Division A.
ECL 是一项全球性的国际象棋快棋职业联赛，同时也是世界国际象棋职业选手的决斗场。作为东方力量代表，成都熊猫战队已经连续两年打进了 PCL 全球四强。在我们的团队中，不乏世界超一流选手，包括像丁立人、于洋一、李超、赵俊等等，也有快速崛起的棋坛新秀，像张帝、李云山、翟墨。以及国际象棋的建设者、爱好者等数百名棋手，组成了一支强大的东方军团，向世界巅峰发起挑战。二零一九年世界 PCL 夏季联赛即将打响，被数千万棋迷提供了与世界超一流选手并肩作战的机会。成都熊猫战队向全世界国际象棋爱好者发出邀请，加入我们。共同征战二零一九年 PCL 夏季联赛，向冠军发起冲击。And hello, everybody. We are back. In 13 minutes, we have the match between the Chengdu Pandas Fan Club and the San Diego Surfers Fan Club. But first. I'm delighted to be joined by Robert Shliachtenko, the player for the San Diego Surfers. Hi, Robert. How are you doing? Good, thank you. You had a you had a great game just now that we were just watching in the、uh, in the knockout against、uh, Jang Di, and now you'll play him two more times with white and black. Is that right? Yes. How do you feel about how that game went? I thought I got a fairly normal position out of the opening, and then、uh, somehow、uh, maybe I played a bit inaccurately going inside castling, which got some counterplay. Eventually, I sacrificed one h four, and I got some inside attack. And at some point, I think around move thirty five, I was either much better or winning, and then I just completely messed up with move knight three.、Mm -hmm. Because、uh, what I missed is that after move g three. Rookie two. I forgot that he can go king c three and king b four. Yeah, yeah. And after that, he just wins my deep one and it's probably draw. Yeah, we forgot that. We forgot that for a second too. All of us watching, but then he got the deep one, and then we thought anything could happen, and somehow you had the nerves to to pull it off. What what kind of a feeling or emotion do you have when you're like, I think I was winning the whole game, and now. You know, it could be a draw, it could be a loss, it could be a win. Like, how do you how do you feel there? Well, of course, it's very frustrating. But just during the game,、uh, you have to just control your emotions and just keep playing and focus on the position. Okay. And are you successful at that? Like, do you feel that frustration, or do you just keep it away? Well, I did feel a bit fr frustrated, but okay. Cool. Well, good on you for keeping it together. Then,、um, <clears throat> have you?、Um, Have you got any tournaments coming up this summer?、Uh, well, next week I'm playing the U.S. Cadets Invitational Championships. Okay, an un an under sixteen championship for the U.S.、Uh, that should be a good tournament. Where is that being held this year? This is in San Jose, so、uh, still、okay. not too far for you.、Um, Isaac,、so、you mentioned. So you mentioned that you were a rookie, you know, earlier this season. You played one match for the San Diego Surfers, and you know, with the San Diego Surfers being relegated and looking towards getting back into the league in 2020,、uh, you know, you're obviously a big part of that effort for the San Diego Surfers team. Can you tell us a little bit about how you guys plan on using this experience that you have from the summer series and turning in that turning that ultimately into a successful requalification campaign? Well, I'm just. I'm just looking to get as much experience as I can, I'm playing these strong GMs. And, and hopefully, for sure. There was one moment during your game with Jean D that you just played where it kind of seemed like you might be able to get out with a draw and then go into the bullet tiebreak where you could, you know, get a fresh game with White and then try to beat Jean D from there to win the match. But you decided to play on. What was going through your mind when you had this kind of decision? Do I go for three move or do I go for the win? Well, first of all, it's still a very imbalanced position because with the material imbalance, this game isn't safe. And I had a time advantage, so anything could happen. And also,、uh, just I really didn't want to go into a bullet tiebreak because I'm playing on my laptop and I don't have a mouse.、So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would give you an incentive to win the game. <laughs> yeah, that was good. 
Have you ever played Bullet without a mouse? I tried once playing a 10 second, 24 hour arena. Did not go well. <laughs> 24 hours of 10 second chess without a mouse. Well, I didn't play the full 24 hours. But... No, no, I mean, you wouldn't I have your fingers left. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, and uh, yeah, are you, are you planning to play in the qualifications for uh, San Diego this fall? I mean, it's just very simple. If uh, team manager, uh, Team Kira, asked me to play, I will. Okay. Cool. So you'd be happy to have given, if, if asked to play, you'll play. So before we, before we let you go, Robert, before the end of the summer series for the San Diego Surfers, you guys do have one more live club match. Unfortunately, we will not be seeing the San Diego Surfers in the playoffs, but what can you tell us about what you want your fans to you know, do during this match with Chengdu, which ultimately you guys are underdogs and have a chance of maybe, you know, Rocking the balance in Group A. I mean, uh, I personally will just try my best to play good chess. And that should apply for everyone. Any advice for fans that you have before before we let you go? Don't play like me. <laughs> cool. So I think that's all the questions that we have for you, Robert. Thanks for joining us here on the uh, Pro Chess League Summer Series interview segment. Um, yeah. As we get ready for the live club match between San Diego and Chengdu, just a reminder for all of you guys out there, you guys can still join the match. There's still seven minutes left uh, before that match starts. Here we can see the, the exact scenario that the Chengdu Pandas would have needed to have qualified. All they needed to do before the night started was either beat Chengdu in the live club match or have St. Louis beat the, uh, the, the San Francisco mechanics. That got a little bit complicated when San Francisco held their ground and tied the match with St. Louis. And yeah. even though Chengdu wound up finishing fourth, in the knockout battles, the math works out. They're going to be into the next stage, meaning the San Diego Surfers and the San Francisco Mechanics. They're going to be on the outside looking in unless they get that third place spot. So, you know, all of these complicated, you know, situations averted. Chengdu, I think, can just have fun with this match for sure. They can't get first uh, because St. Louis just has too many points. But, yeah. you know, that being said, like, it's still a proving ground for them, I think, to, uh, you know, to show what they have going into, you know, the, the end of the Group A, uh, group a section. So, yeah, I think a lot of the fans are playing for fun, you know, so it's more fun to win. If you ask a chess player, are you playing to win or are you playing for fun? A lot of them will tell you, like, I play for fun and winning is fun. So, you know, I'm going to try and win. But, um, yeah, I mean, with the standings, with the standings set, I think, uh, I think everybody's really just going to be having fun. Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. And I think one thing that's worth bringing up is there's not a lot of opportunities for really competitive rapid games here on chess.com, but thanks to a bunch of the events that are running this summer, like the Fisher, uh, the world Fisher random championships and arena Kings. And now the pro chess league summer series fans have a lot of opportunities to play for their different teams. And, you know, ultimately for them in the pro chess league summer series, that could lead up to the best fan prize, um, which is offered every single group. We will be announcing a winner shortly after today's uh, broadcast, you know, in next week's report. Uh, but every group will be awarding a $250 prize to the best fan. That includes streaming, blogging about your games, tweeting us using the hashtag Summer Series, uh, and ultimately playing in the Pro Chess League Summer Series. So you know, feel free to let us know about your thoughts and experiences uh, as, a, as a player of the Pro Chess League. Yeah, absolutely. So this being the end of Division A today, there will be a couple of days after this where you could post your blogs or your comments or whatever about, about the game, tweet about the match that your team played. But basically, this this is the last week to uh, make your case that you are the best fan of any team in Division A. And, uh, yeah. And it looks like we've got our division standings uh, up here for Group A. As you can see here, St. Louis already five points ahead of Chengdu, which means that even if Chengdu were to win, Chengdu at best will finish second, but at worst will also finish second. Let's talk a little bit about how San Francisco can actually make it to the playoffs despite finishing third and not getting the automatic qualification spot. Okay, so... Um, basically, at the end of all four divisions, there will be a fan vote um, between the third place teams from all four divisions. And the fans can pick two more teams from those four that they would like to see join that championship series. Right. And ideally, you want to avoid that kind of vote because at that point, it could be a toss up. It's whoever's on Twitter at that point, whoever's fans are like more engaging. And so yeah. for San Francisco, this is definitely the faith that they want to avoid, but it's going to have to be one that they take pride in. And ultimately, on August 17th, that will be the day that they find out, do they make the cut as one of the two third place teams on the, on the screen you have here? You actually see the path to the playoffs for the San Diego Surfers. They're already mathematically out, but let's take a quick look at what they would have needed to happen 
to you know basically qualify through one of those third place spots. But before were- you go through that, Isaac, I just want to make one comment. As San Francisco manager, um, I have a couple. I remember a couple of things about the mechanics, and I remember that the mechanics have never won a Twitter vote, ever, 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 ever. No, not for game of the week, player MVP, you know, anything like that ever. So that's definitely not the situation we want to be in. I I know and remember that uh, that's not where we want to be. Well, as the former manager of the Pittsburgh Pond Grabber, who's been on the lucky side of maybe some of those Twitter polls for game of the week and move of the week, you know, this is where the fans, it's really up to you guys, where you guys want to step up and, you know, share about your, share your games that you've played in the Pro Chess League and tweet about your experiences and join these clubs for these Pro Chess League teams as the tournament progresses so you can ultimately have your say in terms of who moves into that top 10 uh, playoff bracket. So as we've got yeah. on the screen here, this is what San Diego needs to qualify. Not looking great, but they would have had to have beaten Chengdu. They would have had to have hoped that St. Louis beaten San Francisco, which didn't happen, and then ultimately won the knockout battle. So that's why this match might not necessarily affect like who's going to make the playoffs, but there's a lot on the line in terms of pride and like who can go forward from here. For Chengdu, it's about sending the team off on a great, you know, on a great uh, wave to the playoff. And for San Diego, it's ending the season on a high note so they can go into the qualifiers and you know, ultimately re-qualify into the Pacific Division. Yeah, and a lot of the summer series is about, you know, connecting with fans, energizing your fans. So, like, you know, if you're Chengdu and you win the match, your fans are more energized. It helps you build your fan base for the future. Same thing for San Diego. They want to get, you know, a strong fan base going um, to help them through, uh, you know, any future events that the team plays in. Absolutely. And just a shout-out to Andrea Botez for the raid of 117. Uh, really glad to see you here. I know that Andrea was streaming her games in the Pro Chess League Summer Series, that match between San Francisco and St. Louis. So we're mm-hmm. moments away from this live club match starting, which means that you've just got about two minutes left before this thing starts. Yeah. Thoughts on who might win this one between uh, Robert and uh, Jean D based on that first uh, intense, intense matchup we saw? Well, I would have to favor Robert a little bit. You know, he won that game. He had black that game. He had a really good position, and then he also showed good nerves. I mean, it's a little result-oriented because you could also say he had a good position, then he blew things with knight g3, and, you know, if the game hadn't gone his way, then you'd say, oh, you know. Right. But um, it sounds like even though he was frustrated by that, he figured that in that toss-up position, he had a time advantage, and he sort of still had faith in himself to win the game all over again, right? Because basically, that's, that's the kind of, like, the feeling, right? You're like, I had the game won. And now I'm starting all over again from basically a three result position in a time scramble. So I would have to favor him based on that. How about you? Yeah, for sure. And if I'm general manager, Keaton Kira, uh, who's running the San Diego surface team, watching the stream, I'm taking notes right now. And I'm thinking I have one shot at making it through the qualifiers to get back into the pro chess league. And, yeah. you know, you have to have nerves. If you're going to be a board four. you have to know that, you know, these opportunities to win games don't come often. And when you blow those opportunities and ultimately go back to an equal position, have to have that discipline to overcome. That being said, I think Jean Guy also has a lot to prove tonight. He's shown yeah. earlier in the summer series that he can play against the best of them, including Baruj Nakobian, our current, you know, MVP of the summer series. So yeah. I think it could be interesting. I think we'll see both players push really hard with white and it ultimately come down to how well can they defend with black and, you know, pick the right openings. We saw a little bit of questionable opening choice there from Robert, and, you know, in his game against Nakobian not mm-hmm. falling through with that G5, G4 idea. But, you know, these are two lower-rated opponents, and, you know, they're here to prove to their managers that they deserve to be here. Yeah, I mean, Jang D has definitely already proved himself more, right? So it's like, as Robert, who's out to prove himself. Um, but I, I'm not sure from what you said. Do you clearly favor one or the other in, this, in their two-game match? I mean, like, I, I think it could be really good. you had to... What's that? You think it split is the most likely? 1-1? One, one? I think both both sides will really press with white. I mean, if I've seen anyone play really good chess with black this summer series, it's actually been Zhang Di, who's been really impressive. Remember, he drew uh, Daniel Naranditsky, if I recall correctly. So, you know, yeah. maybe a slight edge towards Zhang Di, but I mean, so far the nerves kind of show me maybe Robert has a chance to win this. Okay. You're still giving me a maybe for either player. I want to pin you down. I want right, to I'll, pick you down. I'll pick Robert. He's playing on a, Robert. on a track pad. He needs, all, he needs all the support he can get. <laughs> This isn't about supporting someone who you think is going to lose by saying you think they'll win. It's about getting it right. It's about being able to say, I knew who would win this match. I I'll, called. Pick, I'll pick Robert definitively. Pick Robert definitively. All right. Here he's coming with a King's Indian attack style game. Um, and uh, we've got kind of like a Sicilian 
dragon from Zhang Di. So room to maneuver. Uh, the interesting factor here is this pawn on c3. Um, it both stops Black's normal plan of knight d4 and maybe gives White the option of d3, d4. Now that that e-pawn is defended by the rook, does Zhang Di need to worry about White playing d4? Yeah, that's one thing that, you know, me personally playing lines like this is Black. Like, I'm always keeping an eye out on it. One idea that Black sometimes plays this early is this idea of knight d7 to try to take away this idea of d4. Here, I don't believe that that would have worked, but at least when White plays d4 in that case, cd4, cd4, and there's like these loose pawns in the center. But I think Black is kind of dead set on this opening idea. Put b5, b4, undermine the c-pawn. If White plays d4, you ignore it, and you kind of move on from there. These positions have a tendency to get chaotic, which is you know great news for us as spectators. Yeah. Uh, but it's I'll agree about with that. The dark squares. Yeah, so without knight d4, the plan becomes b5, b4, try and use the negative of that c3, use it as a hook so that Black can get something going on the queen side. And uh, Robert plays a very respectable h3, showing some concern about playing d4, bishop g4, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that tempo, I think, is is big for Jang D. I mean, because you want to get your pawn to b4 before things get untenable in the center. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you know, I have a lot of experience playing these kind of pawn structures as black. And like, you know, if white, if white doesn't have a concrete way to kind of like break through the center and get like favorable trades or play for like an e5, Black has all the time in the world to play like a5 and b4 and bishop to a6 and really break things open. Not to mention b takes c3 can come at the right moment if white plays like knight d2. And now this rook on b8 is going to be controlling the b file. There's a lot of games where black will play a5, a4, a3, break open this b file, try to put that rook on b2, and then put that queen on either a5 or b6 and just say, I control the dark squares, good luck. And these positions get very tough for white. So white's going to have to be accurate here um, after this idea. Right. He's perhaps going to have to look for the right moment to play e5 before something else happens. But how do you feel about the c takes d4 already happening? Because now we don't have the same kind of b4 idea as before. Generally, I think you want to wait in these lines. Like I, I've seen this line a lot actually with the reverse, with white basically playing the English opening and getting into the structure where black plays rookie 8 and e5. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's kind of like quasi close to slaying positions you always want to keep that tension because that tension can oftentimes favor black especially if you want to play knight d7 with tempo and if white ever plays d5 in that kind of position we talked about favorable benoni's earlier for robert that would be a favorable benoni like structure for jean d mm -hmm. now he doesn't have that same flexibility because he's already committed his central pawns by the way within two minutes the pandas have drawn the first blood we got one point for the pandas up on the board but uh yeah i'm also with you like b5 doesn't seem as useful without that hook on c3. Maybe a3 will be the hook that he needed now. Definitely. I'm not sure why uh, Robert felt the need to play a3 there. I mean, that kind of just seems like a move that gives black time to play moves like a5 and then followed up with b4. If I'm white in this position, I'm trying to figure out how do I get my pieces developed because I now have all the central space. And if I can break through with e5 and get the advantage, like it's very hard for black in these cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean... I I know these positions play a little differently than open games, but I still feel like this is a few too many pieces on their starting squares on the queen side. I feel like if I'm white, I can't play a lot of a3 and h3 moves without ever bringing out, without organizing any of this, this king side, this queen side. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I talked about how you can get this kind of position from an English opening <laughs> with reverse colors, and basically white decided to play black with an extra tempo with this move h3, which... I guess I could get behind if, if it's a playable opening with black, but this move A3, now we're talking about investing time that maybe was better spent just developing these pieces, and I fully agree with you. Black yeah. wants to play moves like bishop A6 and queen B6 and B4 and just blow this game open on the queen right. side where white is just not coordinated. We've played A3, we've played H3, we've played C3, and we've played D3 and then D4. Yeah. So, okay, bishop D2 is a step in the right direction, right? That had to come out at some point. I'm not sure why he's not putting the bishop on g5, and then if black plays h6, yeah, you have to retreat to d2 or something, but you've weakened their king side a little bit to help you if you play e5 later. But in any case, I'm going to approve of any piece coming off the back rank here. Well, I'm not even sure if bishop d2 is like you know, necessarily considered development here. You're going to have to move that bishop again. You know, and sometimes in these positions where you want to contest a long, you know, diagonal bishop on g7, you want to play bishop d2, bishop c3, but that's uh -huh. just tactically not feasible because black is always going to eventually have this idea of b4. So to me, it seems like, well, white's just going to have to move this bishop again. Why not spend that tempo playing like knight c3? And here we have bishop to c3. 
But I think this is a target that Black is okay. Knight b6, knight a4, maybe b4 in the future. This queen is exposed on d3. He maybe seems to think that this is okay. Um, maybe he's planning to play d5 before some of those bad things happen. But I agree, this bishop is going to need some support. Yeah, or, I mean, it's hard to maintain, right? He's going to have to do something. Yeah, queen b6 here. I really like this movement. I was looking at either queen b6 or queen c8. B4 is a really strong move here for, for Black, so that's why White's playing this move B4. But I don't know yeah. if that's necessarily a move that White wanted to play because now the C4 square is really weak. And what did White get in return for this? Especially if Black plays a move like A4, creating a potential pass pawn where that pawn on A3 could be a target. Yeah, I mean, actually, this B4 timing didn't work out that badly for White because temporarily the knight can't come to B6. Black, has, Black took on B4 in order not to lose time, but that means now he's got to defend his bishop and white has the open file, not black. Whereas yeah. if black played a4 himself, it would basically just give white a tempo to do something, right? Yeah, and I think black... That, that Probably the be better option, huh? Exactly. I think black needed to play a4 there, keep that positional bind, find a way to just get that bishop on a6 back in the game in the long run through b7, and somehow play knight b6, knight c4, and keep that rook on a1, on a1, guarding a3. Um, that gives you great chances in the end game. You still have a lot of pressure. I kind of like, you know, what White's done in these past few moves since B takes uh, A takes B4 because now White's starting to get counterplay without even having to develop his pieces. Yeah, somehow this move B4 from White kind of kind of uh kind of killed what Black wanted to do a little bit. And even what what you were saying with, you know, wanting to keep pressure on with knight B6, knight C4. I mean, when White plays knight D2, it won't necessarily be that easy to get a good knight C4. You're not really realistically going to keep the white rook trapped on A1, I don't think. And white's center is looking strong and unchallenged. So actually, I mean, white's position just doesn't feel that bad. Maybe maybe Robert was really onto something with this bishop to c3 that looked awkward. But I mean, even in that case, though, if black can get the knight on c4 and let's say hypothetically knight takes c4, b takes c4, black's clearing the b5 square. He can play like knight c6 to a7 to b5. And now he's got a pass pawn on the c file. So I'm not sure if like it's crystal clear that, that even there, like in white's dream scenario, like this is perfect for white or anything. I think white still has a lot of problems there. But yeah, no, it wouldn't be crystal clear, but remember, it's taking black time to get knight c4. He's got to move the queen, then play knight b6, and then play knight c4. Once that trade happens, the white queen will move off of d3 to c2 and attack the a4 pawn. Now you want to maneuver your knight to b5 without hanging a4. It's a it's a lot to arrange, and meanwhile, white does have that strong center, which can do its own stuff. So That's true, too. Um, so I, I don't know. I feel like... I feel like bishop c3 from Robert was not as bad as it first looked to us. Yeah, perhaps. And now it looks like he's about to emphasize the A file. Um, yeah, we talked about playing slow in the beginning of the game for white, and now I wonder if with this move rook c7, maybe black is the one who's playing too slow, because I don't think the c file is nearly as important right now as the A file, where white is going to get a lot of counterplay. Not to mention this net on d2 can always go through b3 to get to like a5, or maybe play for d5, and then knight d4. Um, and Black's taking forever to get the C-file. So really interesting how things have kind of shaken up here. Yeah, the Black Knights are looking a little bit passive, which, you know, in the old days, this is why people thought that pawn centers were good, right? Was because the opponent's pieces would lack squares. And when you see them retreat to D7 and D8, that's kind of like what White wants. Um, but let's see how the simplification is going to play out with D5. Uh, I guess... Robert's idea is he does this before black plays rook b to c8 and he has any problems on the c file. And he's looking to try and play knight to d4 probably as soon as possible and put some pressure on the b5 pawn. Um, yeah. It's kind of interesting that with these king's Indian positions, I mean, sometimes we talk about how black can get away with this exchange of dark squared bishops and black is still okay there. But in this case, it's distinctly different because black's played this, you know, b pawn up to b5. And that means that the c6 square gets weak with every single trade that occurs. You know, I, I've played a you know a few you know a few tournament games in Europe, and you know I remember watching Josh Fidel analyze a game with international master Kostya Kavitsky and saying it's a rite of passage to lose a game in the King's Indian, where White plays d5, trades off the dark squared bishops, and then just throws pieces at that c6 square. And so that's going to have to be something that Zhang Yi, I think, it needs to keep an eye out for. Luckily for him, all of his pieces are already on the queen side. But I think this is one of those cases where a dark squared bishop trade is just not necessarily a bad thing. Um, for white, and that might be why we even see the e five here. E five. He prefers to bury the dark squared bishop over trading it. Wow. Yeah. I I have to say, 
Isaac, the one thing that I was highlighting as well while you were talking were the knight on d8 and the bishop on b7. In this position where Robert chose to play d5, he knows that if there are various simplifications that happen, the pieces that aren't going to get traded are the knight on d8 and bishop on b7. And there are a lot of scenarios where he can grind that game out um, on the c or the a file and attacking b5 while those pieces are so badly placed. So e5... And he maneuvers his knight to a5. What he really wants is to attack the b5 pawn. This knight is blocking his own file. I'm not, I'm not sure how good this maneuver is. I mean, maybe what White is considering here is playing bishop d2, bishop e3, and then bishop to f1. And then just saying, how are you going to kind of keep your rooks where they are and your queen where they are without kind of uh, losing? So the knight getting off of d2 clears the way for this bishop. But even still, I don't see why I put the knight from b3 to a5. I mean, let's go back a move. Let's play your move, bishop d2. We're almost checkmating that queen with bishop to e3. Yeah. I mean, what's black going to do if he had played bishop d2 this move, Isaac? Yeah, I mean, this, this is already getting like really uncomfortable. And maybe Robert was reacting to maybe there's rook c3 with this knight on b3. But I mean, already, like that's clearly worse for black. I mean, this, this might be you know the golden ticket for white to get a point here for the San Diego surfers. Maybe he didn't like the move rook c4 there. Although then he could play knight a5. And, you know, what's black going to do? Sack in exchange? Okay. <laughs> it's not like black has anything active to do as a follow-up, so. Right. All right. And speaking of active things to do, John D has played an active move, f5. Well, he has to justify e5, right? And this seems like the only way to do that. Yeah, I mean, and if he sees bishop d2 to e3 looming over him, that would also be incentive to do something. <laughs> like, Right, and now the added benefit, you know, for white having spent that extra tempo is black can actually try to think about playing for f4 and kind of take away that e3 square entirely. I'm not totally convinced, though, that uh, black has solved all of his problems. For example, bishop to f1 here is starting to look like something a little bit scary. Obviously, f takes e4 would be the threat followed by knight f6, but something that I think Zhang Vi's, he's not quite out of the woods yet, maybe knight d2 or something like that. Covering that e4 pawn, bishop takes e4, f takes e4, and white still got a lot of pressure. What about um, e takes f5? We haven't even talked about that move yet. e takes f5, just, you know, the simple tactical move. Yeah, um, we have to look at this. Black could play e4, attacking white's queen and opening up the bishop, and things would get really, really intense. Probably queen takes e4, bishop takes c3, and, you know, does white have anything here with queen e8 check and... Or is he just down a piece? <laughs> I mean, Black, I think, even there has knight to f8 at and, and some point to just block the check. Um, yeah. But regardless, I don't think that that would have been a practical decision um, there for White. I think White, you know, considering the circumstances, knight d2 is, you know, a pretty strong move. But he should have, I think he should have played bishop d2 when he had the chance because now it's Black is kind of pushing back and his e5 move is looking more and more justified. Bishop's just kind of a target on c3, right? It's just a thing tying White down to defending it. And he's right. blocked the A-file. And black goes for F4, just like you were saying he might want to. Well, I mean, this is the dogmatic way of playing the King's Indian, right or wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, trading on E4 has the problem that maybe it helps the bishop on G2 to play like a knight C6 kind of idea at some point. Right. Um, not to mention the knight on E4 might be strong. Defending the C3 bishop might be a good score for the knight as well. So he may not have liked F takes E4 at all. And he plays, as you say, the like classic King's Indian move is to play f4. But hang on, he didn't want to trade dark squared bishops. What happens if white takes on f4? So if g takes f4, let's say black plays e takes f4. I mean, I think even there, like white's not, you know, sad or anything about this position. I mean, bishop takes g7, king takes g7. I think what John D's counting on is that he's clearing the e5 square for his knight on d7, which, let's face it, is not a very strong piece right now. Right. Um, it's not really even serving a function, right? Like, it can't go to b6, it can't go to f6. Well, it can't go to f6, but it's like, what is it doing on f6? Um, and so maybe this is his idea, is tempting white to play g takes f4, opening up his k and clearing this e5 square yeah. in the cost of a pawn. Um, because, let's face it, if black doesn't move these knights off of the back rank, at some point the position will open up and it will hurt black. So why not do it now? Right. I think the other thing he might have in mind in answer to g takes f4 would have been rook takes c3. <clears throat> then white has to recapture. Black trades off on c3 and plays e takes f4, winning back his material. 
Yeah, right. and then ID5 followed by like F3 kind of ideas really start to, you know, kind of... Right. The queen retreats, he trades on A1, and then he has the tempo to play ID5 himself, right? So it's sort of like an extra tempo for black, plus a simplification. And the knight on E5 looks, looks pretty strong. So this is an interesting choice, this idea of playing G4. I mean, we talked about bishop d2, bishop e3 earlier. Maybe Robert's kind of hung up on this idea and wants to play bishop e1 followed by f3 followed by bishop to f2. Well, that seems a little bit kind of risky considering the positioning of the king. Yeah, I'm not a fan. I'm not a huge fan immediately um, of g4 because I feel like g takes f4 was an option for white at times and black wasn't really... Well, I guess Black was maybe threatening FG3 a little bit. Right. If we don't want to take back with the Queen. So maybe he had to choose one or the other. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those moments where White maybe regrets putting this bishop on C3 because with bishop to A, you would love to play a move like knight on A5 to B3, hitting the bishop and making it a forcing move and finally getting that knight away from A5. But you can't because that would cut off the defender to the C3 bishop. So instead right. of saying this, you have knight, knight to F3 and... You know, it's an uphill battle, I think, for White to, you know, reorganize his pieces. That being said, if he can do it, he might be better. I mean, you'd be screaming at him to play Bishop F1 if you were his coach right now. If you were Keats, yeah, yeah. you'd be, like, staring at the chessboard, like, in you know, observation mode and just screaming, like, Bishop F1. Oh, he did it! But now it might be too late, right? Because Queen takes B5, Queen takes B5, Bishop takes B5. You have to calculate all of these, like, Rook takes C3, yeah. like Knight takes C4. I it think definitely doesn't work now with Rook takes C3. It you needed the to... hanging Knight on D7. You almost have to play knight back to d2 and then king g2 and then f3 here just so that way you can just like make this bishop f1 move a threat. I think uh, here this bishop needs to drop off of c3. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's too much to be defending that piece all the time. Ugh. You know, what a loser making you work so hard for him and he's not even really attacking anything. Yeah, definitely. And now white has like a first real threat in a few moves, right? Because queen takes b5. That's a really hard pawn to defend, and I don't think black can afford to just give it up. Rook b8 here is going to let white trade off the rooks, maybe, and then put the other rook on the c-file. Hey, he's not worried. Uh, he figured that the only way for white to win a pawn would be g5, kicking the knight off of e4, and then queen b5. He was willing to just trade queen b5, queen b5, bishop b5, knight e4. Um, the consequences of that are pretty unclear because then white comes into the c6 square and opens the a yeah. file. So I don't know if he was right or wrong to allow that, but um, it seems he was only afraid of white playing g5 at the moment. And uh, he's leaving this pawn on b5 for the taking. Yeah, it's kind of funny how like this game, even though it looks like white is really active and black is really active, it's kind of like the tale of who has worse pieces because the knight on f3 can't do anything. The bishop on d2 has been continuously stuck throughout and the knight on a5 is, if anything, blocking away from attacking on the on the other side of the board the two knights aren't actually coordinating in a way that black can get a favorable break to open up this king on g1 so the rooks can slide over so that's almost a competition of whose pieces are worse at the end of the game this bishop's going to be telling robert like i could have gone to e3 i could have been checkmating a queen instead of sitting there like a loser right and we might actually see a repetition now i mean we just saw a knight b3 bishop b7 followed by knight a5 immediately um i mean if i'm white Knight takes b7 isn't that unappealing anymore. Like Knight I'm just B6. glancing at the standings for a second, Isaac. Sorry to, to digress from the chess, but it looks like the Pandas have a six-game lead, 12 and a half, six and a half at the moment. Right, and we've seen this cons consistently throughout the summer series. San Diego falling behind early, but almost always making a comeback. It'll be interesting to see what they do against Chengdu, a team that once they start scoring points, they almost seem to stop scoring points. Um, so I'll be curious to see how does San Diego react to the Chengdu attack. Yeah, Chengdu also, it's true, they often have a really good start. They score a lot of points early on on the lower boards. For sure. So it looks like Robert decided to not repeat moves. He could have played knight b3, allowed bishop b7, and just gone into the next game, but he seems determined to try to win this one. Now yeah. bishop to e2, I guess the question is, where does this knight on h2 think he's going? Probably back to f3 at some point, I and mean, there's nowhere better to go, but... Uh... I mean, the real plan is still bishop e1 to f2 at some point, right? Well, here he goes. He, he bites the bullet, and now he's going to allow knight takes e4. And it doesn't make sense to me. Like, why would you play knight h2 and then allow this when you could have at least played f3? Oh, and there we go. Bishop to bishop oh, to so d3. He thought he had this tactic, f3. but he didn't have this tactic. Or did he? I mean, <laughs> he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. What the? 
I mean, yeah, black is taking on a2, white's going to take on e4, rook takes a2. Is this b-pawn going to be enough? Because this knight on h8 and this bishop on g7 are pretty bad. There are yeah. no numerous King's Indian games where white will sacrifice the exchange, but black is left with like a bishop on g7 that's just not a piece. If black can't, if black can't play like d5 there, I mean, this b-pawn should be enough to, to convert things. Depends how he handles it, though. Can he go just b6 here? Yes, his knight's yeah. defended. He could. It would allow d5, though. Okay, so instead, knight to b7. Whoa. You, you can't even play bishop a5 here, so you're going to have to yeah, go back, rook c5 again. What? I'm confused. <laughs> wow. Okay, he gets his bishop out dramatically, but the white bishop's much better on d5. Yeah, I mean, to me... Um, I mean, Makes a lot more sense. I mean, black's going to play e3, but if anything, that's going to actually make white a little bit safer uh, with regards to all this counterplay, right? Yeah, but it's it's like weirdly intense here. Knight c6 is a very strong answer, though, to that rook move. Knight yeah, c6 yeah, okay. is just ow. Because you want that knight into c6 anyway. It's a huge tempo, helps and with the beep on. And the key there was to just not let black play this move rook d1, and now I think you can just play b6. Um, well, actually, b6 might be still too early. You have to get this knight on h2 into the game. Yeah, it's 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 grim. I mean, the other thing you might want to get in is your bishop into the game. So can you play king e2, rook c2 check, king d1, sack that stupid knight, and then have bishop b4 check at the end? Is there any way you can make that work out? Actually, I kind of like what Robert's doing, because what he's doing is by putting the knight on b4, black can't put the rook behind the pawn. And so now he actually has a direct threat of trying to be able to play b6, b7, b8. So he's trying to do it without his kingside pieces. <clears throat> Seems risky. Seems vicious, but okay, bishop takes c4. Yeah, he's going for bishop b4 check here. He's got 20 seconds. Jang D has 45, which is a nice, nice time advantage at this stage. You definitely have to feel though, like after the initial sacrifice exchange, exchange sacrifice, like white was just better after that. So, oh yeah, white was crushingly better, buddy. So here, okay, now this is this spells trouble because king e two, rook c two. If king g two, now e two. Yeah, he cannot deal with this now. But you, okay, you're only down an exchange still. I mean, you can play b six, bishop b four, bishop b four. No, he, stops I mean, e1 he was already losing to e two, just queening the pawn, I think. So, but e two, then bishop b four, stopping e one queen, right? If the rook's on h2. Okay. Okay, I guess so. Oh, he can take and queen. Oh, what a blunder from Jang D. That's two in a row, unfortunately. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Robert is <laughs> Robert's pretty, pretty on point when he's low on time, huh? Yeah, so the key is to just make sure that you keep a pawn. Shouldn't be too hard to do, considering like the closed nature of the structure. and then just Yeah, just... Shoulder. Come take g5 with the king. Now, fortunately for Zhang Di, that means he's going to have to take an L on this one. Just as I thought that he'd blown it and lost the game, he then won the game. What? <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, like, really impressive showing. I saw Keaton there in the chat say, great job with the cut, oh, yeah. Robert. Coach is watching. Coach is watching. He's like, I know there's only seconds before the next game starts, so we got to get the we got to get that praise in real fast. Absolutely. So but, well, before we get too deep into this game, let's take a look at some of our streamers who are playing through our stream squad, which if you haven't yeah. seen, you can actually watch all of our affiliate streams at the same time. The St. Louis Chess Club was actually streaming with us earlier through the stream squad. Tonight we've got Helms Knight and Gold Destroy playing. Helms Knight playing on one of the top boards for the Chengdu Pandas. Yeah. And Helms Knight also played today for um, St. Louis. Uh, Saint Louis. Yeah. So... So it looks like she's playing another tough opponent in uh, NK123. She looks like she yeah. lost her first game, but she's, you know, she's got a decent position in this game. I mean, like, she's got potential to play A3, B4. This F5 square, if she can put her knight on F5 and kind of stop Black from, you know, playing F5 and e E4 himself, like, that gives her chances. Um, yeah. What do you think about Helms Knight's position here? Um, I think... I think the extra pawn must mean that Black has the advantage, even though White can make it tough for Black. I think you're right that the goal is to blockade the f5 square. I just think it's it's tough to do long term. So I would guess that long term black's actually winning. Yeah. Because their extra pawn is just two two pawns in the center. I mean, it's like hard to hold that up long term. 
Yeah, and that night G three move, and you know, I immediately my reaction to that is like, oh, I mean, unless Black Mike makes a mistake and all this time trouble, it's just not going to look that great. You know, for me, I was even thinking, does White even want to play G four there, play King H one, put the Queen on G two, and say, okay, if you take, I'm going to just play G takes F five, and now how are you going to make progress in the center? Yeah, to at least really challenge Black when it comes to like, the amount of time left on the clock. That G four would be the one way to do it, um, but it seems like her strategy here is to play super fast and not give and basically turn the game into a bullet game right and then if she ever feels that black plays like a suspicious move maybe she'll stop and sort of try and figure out how to take advantage of it but her overall strategy is not to have like a deep thought about you know the f5 square and this or that but to really like keep it moving so that nk might flag here yeah, and and uh, she got him down to 1.1 seconds so yeah, and the one thing to, you know, if you if you aren't familiar with Helms Night stream, she streams weekly on, I believe, Saturday mornings usually. Um, very strong doubles chess player. She's like 2,700, which means they're like one of the top players in doubles chess and all of chess.com. Yeah. Uh, so she's a very tactical player. Here she might be getting herself into a little bit of trouble, though. This idea of queen takes g2 mate, obviously, you know, a, a threat that you, you're going to have to deal with. So knight takes that force force there. Uh, yeah. But I think this this is not looking that great anymore. Um I mean, it's okay. She's got this thing that defends it. The winning idea for Black was to trade on F5 and then play Knight H4 at the end. That would have won yeah. instead of Knight F4. And now she's got a couple chances. I mean, she could take this oh, yeah. move repetition right now if she really wanted to. She doesn't um, even need to anymore. I mean, right. things have gotten so much better. Yeah, I mean, this F4 pawn at some point will drop. You can play yeah. Queen D5 here if you wanted to. Queen A7 mm -hmm. is also good. Oh, I think she picked the wrong pawn with the A pawn. Yeah. I think you had to go for the F pawn. You bring your yeah. queen closer to the center through E5 because now your queen is off sides, right? Like you, yeah. you want to be materialistic, but if your queen's on the other side of the board and your opponent's queen is active, material almost doesn't matter in that case. And now, okay, black has a draw if he wants it. Um, yeah. And considering the time situation, I, I think it's a practical decision. But although F3, like after rook F2 is, you know, something that I think Helms Knight needs to be a little bit scared of. Yeah, queen F6 check and queen F3 will handle it actually. Yep. So, I mean, but that's like the key to having got the queen back towards the center at least a little bit with queen b6. But yeah, going to a7 was super, was super risky. Absolutely. And all right. Um, you want to check back on our top board or you want to check out how Goldust Tori is doing? I'm not seeing her pop up on my... Roster, oh, her maybe. games have finished. Yeah, I think she's, games she's have finished, finished already. So let's take a look at our, our top players since this will be the last time that they play in the Pro Chess League Summer Series yep. for the Summer Series Championship. Let's put our eyes where the manager's eyes are. Right on these guys. Ooh, this is a classy position. I mean, if you know, if we can give these guys any credit, you know, considering that these these games ultimately won't determine the seating for the playoffs, they have done a spectacular job of giving us just exciting games to watch every single round. Um, and I think we're going to see even more tactics here. H5 is coming up. This king on G2 is going to be busted wide open. But yeah, okay, I think H5 is playable right here because GH5, he can play bishop H5, bishop H5, and come into G3 with the queen. Yeah, definitely something I think Zhang Di might want to pay a little bit more attention to. But okay, we've seen Zhang Di play, and he's definitely made the most of really bad positions so far tonight just by his results. Yeah, it's also super important to play H5 so that on B5, you can play moves like C takes B5 and not lose to queen C8. So. Yeah, I think rookie seven was over preparation, and uh, but this is a nice move c five actually because if queen c five he has a uh, if queen c five he has rookie two check rookie two yeah and uh, yeah I mean if white takes with the bishop it's mate so white would have to play rook f two and still be in big trouble so yeah. so he gets c five and b six and now white's got like no counterplay. Yeah, this is a position you definitely don't want, especially in this time control where it's just really hard to come up with ideas. Black is a free hand, h5, yeah. h takes g if he wants to. Maybe h4 at that point with the idea of queen g3, and now this rook on f2 is really loose. Um, yeah, I mean, Zhang Di's up against the wall. Yeah. h5 is still the move you really want to play. And wait, does bishop takes d3 win? Let's look at that for a second, too. Bishop takes d3, e takes d3, rook takes f3. It looks pretty clear, doesn't it? I mean, there's not, there's not like six different moves you have to analyze. Yeah, and I think that's why Robert's stopping and thinking here. And yeah, we see it immediately. Bishop d3, really good choice by him to Boom. take this extra time. Uh, it's the first time that Zhang Di's been up on the clock, but unfortunately for him, it just means he has a weak king, and I don't think he's getting out of this one alive. Wow. 
So the best practical chance when something like this happens is to trade in your queen with queen d3, and you can look for blockades with the light squared bishop. Black doesn't have a passed pawn in that position, so you still have like some small chance. Okay, so queen d5, I think, is also like a decent chance of trying to get counterplay because you're exposing the fact that, okay, black could, you know, has some back rank problems. Maybe this b6 pawn gets a little bit loose. But black's just really active here. Uh, you know, I, I would not want to, yeah. you know, continue. I think this is like completely lost because he's got rook e8. So bishop takes b5 yeah. is like a super simple way to do it. Lights out. The one thing I was thinking you could blunder would be like bishop takes e2, bishop takes e2. Now your queen's attacked. So you play rook e2 and then queen d8 check. Rook e8 would be forced, then they sack the queen and pick up f4. That's the one blunder I saw. And then you'd probably lose that end game. So bishop takes b5 first is a very good idea, I would say. Yeah, for sure. And Zhang is trying everything he can here with rook b1, trying to go after that b6 pawn. But even if he can, take, he can take on b6, there's no rook b8 mate because that queen on f4 just covers so many squares. I think at some point you want to just play h6, g6, give yourself some air. But, I mean, as long as Block doesn't blunder any, you know, pieces, he's, he's on a nice course to win this game. Yeah, I mean, well, where's he going to put the bishop? I mean, the simple approach would be, like, he plays something like bishop d7, rook b6, h5. But then you give up, you know, several queenside pawns. I wonder if, I wonder if Robert's satisfied with that. I mean, he probably wants to break through on e2. It seems like such an easy way to break through, so he wants to keep his bishop on that diagonal. But there aren't a lot of options to do it. So Bishop takes E2. Here we go. Long look at Bishop takes E2. That's what I would also have been looking at if I were playing here. I'd be looking at this. Queen G. But the rook E2 move still doesn't work, we know. So then it's Queen G3 check. The king has to go to F1 to defend the rook. And then you have to play well, right. you play Queen H3. That allows Queen G2. Then the queen's not hanging. Um, so we'll go, we'll assume he'll play King F1. And then And then what's next? Here there's there's a rook takes e2, there's queen takes h3, there's pawn to d3. Ooh, la la, pawn to d3. What do you think yeah. of that? Yeah, I, I was trying to make rook takes e2 work, but I think d3, just blunt force, is enough to get it in. You kind of you don't have to worry about your back rank problems because you always have to rook back to e8. And now if that bishop goes back to d1, I mean, rook e1 is just made on the board. Oh, actually, if d3, bishop takes d3, we do have the back rank. I forgot about. There's queen to a8. If rook takes d3. Yeah, but at that point, don't we still have queen takes h3 in her mezzo first? And now, well, I guess after rook g2, queen h1, now he doesn't have rook g1 because queen takes queen. So you have to block with queen g2. And now you can Wait, take so you're saying d3, bishop d3, now you'd play queen h3? Right, because if queen g2, I can take the bishop now. With queen g2, you can get yeah. the bishop. Yeah. Maybe that's the, that's the way to go about it. And queen g1, rook g3, rook g2, rook g2, queen g2. Oh, no, we still can't take on d3 there. Hmm. Not clear, but he's played a move, hasn't he? I think no. we're still stuck here after he's king, king f1. one that's it. Okay. So that was Zhang D thinking for a moment on king f1. So now what will Robert do? Yeah, Robert's got a really important thing here, not to mention that with the games left, he kind of wants to win. It's 22-14, but a couple wins might be able to put the momentum back into the San Diego surfers' favor, as we've seen time and time again so far yeah. this summer series. So he really needs to convert this one. And oh, just eight points is a lot, though. I mean, they're running out of games to make up that difference. Yeah, I think they need a perfect run here. Yeah. So it's all about impressing the manager now for, for Robert. I think that uh, from what I'm looking at, Chengdu has won the match so very strong showing for them in the live club matches right i mean bar dominated the three knockouts and chengdu swept the three club matches reasonably convincingly i mean they won all three yeah i mean the one thing i do have to give san diego a lot of credit for is 22 points is by far the least amount of points that chengdu has scored in any live club match so that uh, is true chalk that up to tough defense for sure for these uh you know, for the, for the fans of the surfers, you know, as their summer series debut comes to an end. And I think for Robert, if he was, if he's able to win this one and finish a night at three out of four, it might not have been pretty, but at that point you've scored three out of three against one of the best four, board fours in the pro chess league. I don't think yeah. Kira could have asked for more um, from Robert going into tonight's games. Yeah, probably not. I mean, you'd be very demanding if you asked for more than that. 
Yeah, I mean, beat, beat Jacoby and, and Shakelin both with black. <laughs> right. Like, I want you to beat two GMs in a row with black. Yeah, and I think we definitely saw that with Robert and his expectations for himself personally in the interview where he was just like, I just want to play good chess. Like, you know, I'm not really worried about making the playoffs or not or, you know, what this means for the, the qualification stages later on. I just want to play really good chess. And I think that that lack of pressure – that's the difference between how Robert's playing right now and the way Zhang Di is playing right now. Because maybe Zhang Di entered the night thinking he alone needed to topple a Kobe and, and you know move ahead of St. Louis in the standings. Um, but we're seeing a lot of really great chess from Robert today. I would be surprised if he's not in that lineup consideration for San Diego's qualification bid in 2020. Yeah, I like the aggression that he's shown. I mean, honestly, even the game against Mar, I mean, he should have played G5, G4. That's the aggressive option. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, as he had mentioned, he only played in one Pro Chess League match. That was a battle royale where you play people your level. That was his first ever Pro Chess League game against a GM. And I think if he wears off these nerves a little bit, practices a little bit more during the offseason, has a good cadets tournament as he plays in next week, he's in good form then for the qualification stages later this fall. Okay, so now we've got Bishop takes D3 on the board. As we Bishop mentioned, D3 loses because of Queen A8 and then Puzzle Rush Mate. So we're looking at queen takes h3 with the idea that if you play queen g2, there are ideas of rook takes d3 because that queen is pinned. You can't right. play queen a8 because of the king on f1. Yeah. Okay, so king g2, a little bit risky, right? Although I guess... I think that was the move he had to play, actually. Yeah. Um, Rook g2. And now if you take on yeah. a g2, queen takes g2, you can't take that bishop because, again, queen a2 mate. It's still a queen mate. You don't he have still to has to play a move like h5 or something i mean it's really oh h5 doesn't even get rid of mate anymore it's really yeah. plaguing him that he didn't play h5 yeah and i'm just trying to figure out how can i string enough checks together that i can take this bishop and not have to worry about back rank because if black can take this bishop black is definitely better but it's just not working out for him so rook takes g2 for example queen takes g2 queen e3 you know white yeah. is more than happy playing like king h1 and now again queen takes d3 queen a8 mate there's just no way of getting around that What's interesting, right. though, is if maybe black can play rook takes g2, queen takes g2, queen takes g2, king takes g2, and say, okay, you've got the bishop, but I have pawns, and pawns win these games. That He's might got be a lot of pawns. I wouldn't even want to trade queens. I mean, I see what you're saying. He could make that trade, then go, then go into this end game, but he's pretty much like losing the b pawn immediately, and then it's only three pawns. I think if you want to play something like this, you're better off leaving queens on the board because the white king's exposed. So basically... Playing G6. There we go. Some version of G6, like in this exact position, is the right move. Um, it's not good for him, but practically, I think that's the best chance that he had at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, this is actually kind of a forcing move on this Bishop on D3. White will, you know, maybe play a move like Bishop to C4, so there's pressure on F7 or something. Uh, and then that's the real test for, uh, for Black. Like, wh what do you really have? Um, you know, you have all these pawns, but if your king is going to be weak and exposed, I mean, that could be a problem as well. I mean, I could see bishop c4, rook f1, and if black doesn't have good counterplay, then black's extra material almost doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, all black's pawns are fairly irrelevant. None of them are strong, right? None of them are doing anything. It's just like if he could somehow get to an end game where he clips the pawn on a3, maybe white runs out of like resources with which to win. I uh, hear. Maybe it's correct to move the rook on e7 because queen d8 is like the real threat. Right. Um, so I wonder if there's any good move with that rook. Yeah, the one thing maybe I think bring is another to e, Maybe bring another rook to e3 or something. Okay, so he's going to trade on g2. And I think the one thing that's unfortunate for Robert and you know all these simplifications, you know, generally if you have three pawns versus one on the queen side, you're pretty content with that. But he is like the worst possible pawn structure outside of like isolated doubled pawns. Yeah, he, he does have, have he does have queen h6 back to e3 again and again. So I mean that might be the practical choice at this point. Even the scenario is not bad for him at the moment. Well, I wonder if he's thinking about h5 though. H5, g takes h5, rook e5 as a as an aggressive option. If he could get rid of either the A or the G pawns, then he's really like running white out of things with which white can win the game. So right. I'd be super happy to pick up one of the white pawns here as I try to activate the black rook. 
Yeah. Okay. So King G7, this is a nice way of stopping Queen D8. You're consolidating a little bit. White doesn't actually have a check. That's useful. In fact, White, other than Rook takes B6, doesn't really have like a forcing move that he needs to consider. So, so Rook B6. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Rook, Rook F1, I'm kind of confused by. But I thought like, okay, after Rook B6, like Black can kind of either go after the A3 pawn or maybe the G4 pawn and build up these kind of free tempi that he gets for this move. I mean, Rook F1 ties Black down to F7. So now there's no like H5, Rook E5 kind of business. But Queen A3. If you're not playing rook takes b6 and black just plays queen takes a3, what's white doing? Right. Like, like how are they ever not, not losing, basically? I mean, because it can flip really quickly from losing to winning without any draw in between the uh, evaluation in these kinds of positions. Um, you know, so. Right. And okay, like if white plays like king h2 here, I mean, it starts to get really awkward to defend. I liked your idea that you brought up earlier, this idea of h5 followed by like rookie five and like rook h5 and you know this lack of shelter is going to be really problematic for white i think this this mistake of rook f1 i mean rook b6 was just such a natural move there you have to play it wow rook f2 so now on queen a3 you know there's also the possibility of rookie one in some scenario well i mean i don't i don't think you should overthink this as black just take that pawn in a3 white's not white's not doing anything right now yeah, I'm kind of surprised that, um, you know, White's playing the way that he is. I mean, it felt like White had a chance to be in the driver's seat. Um, but he seems content playing passively, which is, you know, which is kind of unusual considering the way that we've seen Zhang Di play against some of these elite grandmasters. I think the thinking may have been some kind of thing, like, I need to cover my king. Like, you see so many lines where, like, Robert had perpetual checks. He's like, I got to cover my king. But he's, like, forgetting, like, if you don't take on B6, like, there's nothing about your position that's winning. Like, the guy doesn't need a perpetual if you're not doing anything to win the game. Um, right. So. Okay, but now this is an interesting moment because, okay, queen f6 is the threat, so I imagine black's playing rook e6 here. And then maybe white throws in queen d7 going after that f7 pawn again with the idea of maybe playing right. bishop d5. So black's to not totally out of the woods yet. I mean, the extra No, but the other thing black could do is he could throw in rook e1 check here to save the rook and then cover f6 by bringing his queen back to the long dark square diagonal that's another big option for black that might be pretty nice yeah i mean at that point white might play queen d5 and force that uh, rook to go back to e7 but still quite strong i actually really like what he did because of king h2 then there's queen e5 and like okay there's no question that black is going to be better there so yeah. bishop one is forced but now this bishop is just not a good piece anymore or at least you know worse than it was before yeah to some extent, it was never amazing. But this is kind of a cool solution because now on queen d7, for example, he could play rook f6. Right. Basically, once he takes that rook off, the bishop's not going to beat five pawns in an endgame, right? Like, I mean, it's so huge between the a3 pawn or the b6 pawn. If white takes the b6 pawn, black's pawns are disconnected. There's no strong pawn on the board for black. So you've got three pawns against a bishop, but they can just completely lose and do nothing. Yeah, Once you take it on a3, you've got three connected passers, three on one on the king side. Right. And an important note here, white played queen c7 instead of queen d7, because of queen d7, then black plays this move queen d4 followed by rook f6. You can't afford to trade queens, so you're just worse. So here, queen c7, I think black could have still... Queen d4, okay. queen f7, check, right? Oh, yeah, that's still true. So, okay, you had to play rook f6. It but... was probably going to be rook f6 either way, but I think... Basically, it's an easy win for Black once <laughs> once he makes this trade. It's becoming quite simple. Yeah, um, I mean, you just have to not drop the B6 pawn and kind of weather the storm a little bit. Maybe try to trade off for this G pawn to expose White's king, force a queen trade, and game's over. Yeah, so, wow. So, I mean, obviously the game's still going to be played out. Uh, a draw was just offered by Zhang Di, but probably he just missed the resign button, I have to think. Uh, um, I mean, I would already start asking you, like, how impressed are you with how Robert played today? I mean, you know, if I'm if I'm Keaton Kira and I'm looking at, you know, someone who's a potential board for me in the Pro Chess League season, like, it, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't pretty even, right. but it showed that he was a resourceful player. And, you know, I think that if San Diego maybe had someone like a Robert playing this way every single week, they might be in a completely different position in the playoffs. I mean, three right. out of four on any given day. I mean, it's it's bad luck that they, they only took third in the knockout battle instead of maybe second, you know, winning the, the initial oh. match or something. But another yeah. nice move from him. Look at that. Just I mean, if Bishop chess. takes C4, Queen C6. But as you say, like, yeah, it wasn't perfect. I mean, there were obviously um, some, some sloppiness here and there. Like, 
his last game against Zhang Di was like total mayhem from a position where he was winning. Mm-hmm. Um, and his first game also with Zhang Di in the in the knockout, also he was winning and played knight g3 and it became mayhem. But I mean, we're talking board fours, not board ones, right? The guy's not 2,700. So yeah, there's going to be some awkwardness. But if you come out on top in complicated positions, wow, yes, that's what you want from a board four. Exactly. And it's worth noting that even though Zhang Di's fide is 1,900, we generally accept that he plays way above his 1,900 rating. Let's take a moment and also note that even though Robert's 2,100 fide, his USCF is about 2,400 these days. And so he's consistently proven himself both in blitz and in, you know, in over-the-board time controls in the United States. So you know, this is something I'm sure Keaton's going to be looking at and being like, okay, Summer Series didn't go as planned. We didn't have our best players, but we learned yeah. a lot about our team. And if you go back and you look through the results that they had during the regular season, there were numerous matches where they were like, man, if I had a really good board four, this would be a completely different game. And they might have just found it tonight. Yeah, Robert's had this for a while, even you know when he was like eight years old and much lower rated than this and much younger. But he, he plays a lot of good like positional feel moves um, in positions that, that younger players normally don't have the kind of experience or knowledge. But that queen d4 move, centralizing there, hitting g4, working towards queen d2 and c2, that was super strong. That was like... A very, very good sign to move like that. Yeah, for sure. And just King H7 here, making sure to not allow any three move repetition. And I think that uh, instead of hitting that draw button, we're going to see Zhang Di hit that resign button. Um, okay, like Queen D5, and then just put the Queen on C5, and it's game over. Well, then Queen F7. It's uh, Queen F7. Okay, let's not let's not be me. Okay, but I, yeah. this is this is still quite good. Yeah, this stuff is tricky. I mean, he may still need the A pawn to win this. He may need to. Okay, this is a good around. one. Seven. I mean, you're forcing you're forcing White to think a little bit. You're gaining time on the clock. It's important to use this two second increment to your advantage in these moments where you know, like, you're two moves away from, you know, winning the game. So a four, a three, yeah. a two. He's got his eight seconds. Somehow he got up to ten seconds with that repetition. So that's good. He wasn't just he was just fishing for something. He he was playing it quickly. Here comes the a pawn two joining the party. Yeah, I think you can still play a2 here, and you're not even worried about the c pawn anymore. I mean, yeah, I mean, you'd have to be shocked if a2 getting a new queen didn't win the game here. Absolutely. And he's done it. All right, he's not going to like pre move a1 queen, so that's nice. Oh, he doesn't even need the queen. He could have played a g5 there, king h5, queen h2 mate, a queen h3 mate, right? I think he had mate. He did have mate, yep. But he had a plan in mind, which was check till his queen was covering f2 and then queen, right? He had all the right instincts of the queen endgame. Now, white had a bishop, and he didn't. Yeah. But he played that exactly with all the, like, right moves. I'm not good enough at queen endings to say this for sure, but I think <laughs> that he played that with all the right queen ending type moves. Um, and even though his opponent had a bishop, for him, he's still playing a queen ending, and he had all the right instincts there including little tactical details so i'm super i'm super impressed with that yeah uh, that was awesome it's, it's kind of a bittersweet note for san diego because they'll leave the summer series having lost all three live club matches but robert mm-hmm. tonight he's the hero because he goes two for two in this yeah. match with john d yeah i mean they found a hero i mean that was the most that they could get out of today i think i know you said mathematically there was still a route to third place for them but for me just to find like a strong board four to have like some to have some fun, um, I think that was pretty good for them. So, yeah, that was fantastic from Robert. I imagine he's pretty pumped about that. Definitely. Let's talk a little bit about our Group B teams that will be playing next week at 8 a.m. Pacific time here yeah. on twitch.tv slash chess yeah. if we can bring up that group. So, so just remind everybody of the time change going into next week and which teams you know are up next for your rooting pleasure and your fan play support. You know? And so thank you, Helms Knight, for the raid. Um, and so where Group B teams, we've got Baden-Baden, Barcelona, Pittsburgh, Reykjavik. I think compared to the three, the four other, the three other groups in the summer series, this has to be the group of life because every single team has a shot at making the playoffs, which means it's a hundred percent up to the fans to represent their team and show up on Sunday to secure that spot into the top two. Yeah, I mean, compared to having two final four teams in the same bracket, um, Everything probably has to feel like a little bit more hopeful, but um, but as you say, I mean, there's a lot of good teams in these divisions. Group C is going to have the Eagles, who are really strong. 
as well as the Wizards and Movers who are, you know, tried tried teams from the regular season. And, so, and on top of that, the Capybaras are the best kept secret of the Protest League Summer Series because they've actually gained 300 fans despite having only attempted to qualify to the Protest League through the qualifiers. You know, obviously they're backed by Grandmaster Akrikor McTyrion, who's a quite strong Brazilian Grandmaster here. But I'm sure they're going to be really excited about their debut. They have a very active club. Uh, for those of you who want to jo go join the first South American team to debut in the Protest League Summer Series. Yeah. So next week, you guys, Snowballs, Raptors, pawn Grabbers, Puffins, uh, you can pick one or two favorite teams that you want to try and play for over the course of uh, Group B, which will again be a three-week divisional play, all play all for four-team round robin. For sure. So let's take a look at how tonight's matches affected our bracket um, for the for the Pro Chess League Summer Series Championship, which will start as soon as Group D is over. Um, St. Louis and Chengdu tonight, they've qualified. They don't have to worry about fan total changes or anything. Their spots are locked. They're going to currently yeah. be St. Louis in the number one seed spot and Chengdu in the number five seed spot as the highest rated uh, second seed team that would have made it to the playoffs. San Francisco not in gray here on the standings because they still have that outside shot of winning a Twitter vote Maybe this is the yeah. one time that you guys actually, you know, see the San Francisco Mechanics win an important Twitter vote in the Pro Chess yeah. League. So they're not in gray yet, San Diego. That would be a first. It would be a first. But, I mean, if the, if the Pro Chess League continues for enough years, you'll get to see a lot of different firsts. So why not? Yeah, for sure. And so, of course, it's all up to the fans every week to show up and, you know, represent their teams and do their best. And for the San Francisco fans who want to, you know, see their teams make it to the end, you know, continue being active in your club, streaming, and you know, supporting your, your local Pro Chess League teams – as the summer series continues. So definitely yeah. a lot of excitement there. Um, my last, my last note, Isaac for the night would be to everybody watching. Like if you're in the running for the fan prize, like this is it, you've got, you know, three, three, four days, maybe to post your, your games. I don't know exactly when the decision is going to be made, but I assume you've got a couple days to post your games, post what you were thinking about your impressions from the, from the season. And, uh, you know, maybe tweet them at, at the summer series, tweet them at, at me so I can look at, at the games that I haven't managed to see during these, you know, 20 and 30 board live club matches. We don't get to see every game. So if you saw a cool game, played a cool game, share it with us. Yeah, definitely. And it's worth, you know, mentioning that fan prize because the number one fan from this group A will get a $250 prize for being the best fan and the most active on social media. If you're just tuning into the Pro Chess League Summer Series and you haven't heard anything about it, you should definitely try to be active as the best fan. And then if you don't get it this time, well, there's three more groups left and your chance to earn a $250 prize just for being the best fan, not even based yeah. on results. That's actual money. That's not a 250% discount on you get to buy something from chess.com. That's not $250 off your next purchase of a membership. That's not $250 of credit towards buying something. That's that's cash. That, that is cash. So that might be the, you know, that, that might be the, uh, uh, that might show who's like the biggest winner in the Pro Chess League Summer Series group stage. But, you know, before we end it tonight, I mean, we definitely have some winners in St. Louis, Chengdu, San Francisco clinging on, but there's still a little bit of work to do. And I believe uh, before we sign off, we're going to be rating James Canty for the post-game uh, analysis show. So, yeah. So as in previous weeks, he'll be looking over viewer games. So, you know, maybe get the link to your game, send it to him and, and go check out some, some viewer games. Yeah, and it's a really exciting show. I've tuned in a couple times myself. He does a great job of working with lower rated players, especially who are trying to learn and have really instructive games. So make sure you follow us with the raid. You go to his, uh, you know, you go to his stream and you, you send him his games. So it uh, should be a really exciting stream for those of you guys who played in the live club matches. All right. Bye. See you guys next week. See you guys.